Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Microsoft Outlook 2021 video course. Outlook is the email calendaring application used worldwide. This course is for anyone looking to learn about all the really cool features Outlook has to offer from beginning to end. In the first module, you'll learn how to be more efficient when managing your mailbox, how to modify settings within Outlook before learning how to attach files and items to emails. We'll end that module by learning how to track, recall, and resend messages. The second module gets into creating folders, categories, and learning how to mark messages for organization purposes. You'll also learn how to add and edit contacts, schedule appointments, events, and meetings, and save notes and create tasks associated with an email. As mentioned, the introductory portion of this course has two modules. Module one will cover the basics of Outlook and module two will cover managing Outlook. Let's look at what we're gonna cover in this first module. So the basics of the Outlook module will help you to navigate Outlook and talk about how we can format our messages with attachments and also track them. We have four learning outcomes for this module. At the end of it, you should be more efficient when managing your mailbox. You'll be able to modify settings within Outlook, attach files in an email, and you'll be able to track, recall, and resend messages. Now we do have files in the video description that we're going to use. There are actually five files in the video description, but we're gonna use four of them during the course. The ones we're gonna use in this module is a Word document named Outlook 2021 Course Outline, an Excel file named Excel Essentials, and a portable network graphics file named Learn It Logo. You can go ahead and get those files from the video description and put them in the same folder that you can access on your computer. And while you're there, go ahead and grab another file it's called Disney.pst. That's an Outlook data file, and we're going to use that later in the course. We're going to reach those learning outcomes by going over these four lessons. So the first lesson is getting started with Outlook. Lesson two is all about formatting messages. In lesson three, we'll start working with attachments and illustrations. And lesson four will customize message options. Our topics in lesson one are navigating the Outlook interface so you become comfortable working in that environment, working with messages, and how to get help. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is have a tour of the Outlook interface so you can get comfortable in its environment. We're gonna start at the top of the screen, that blue band. On the left side, you have a quick access toolbar like you see in other Office applications. It can be customized for icons that you use most frequently. You have a search box, and all the way to the right, you have your window control buttons. Underneath that, you have the typical Microsoft ribbon. In Outlook, you have a Home tab on the ribbon, the home tab is divided into groups like all your ribbon tabs. So you'll see the group names underneath the icons. For example, on the home tab, there's a new group. There's a delete group, respond group, etc. Sometimes during the course, I'll say something like go to the home tab of the ribbon and in the quick steps group, do a particular thing. So you'll see how your ribbon tabs are organized by groups. 
We also have a send and receive tab, a folder tab, a view tab. You may or may not have the developer tab. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. We're not going to be using it during the course. You have a help tab and you may or may not have the Acrobat tab. You would only have that if you have the full Adobe Acrobat program on your system and then you could have the Acrobat tab on your ribbon. I'm going to go back to the home tab and I'll just mention this. I didn't cover the file tab because when you click on file in any Microsoft Office application, it takes you to a view known as backstage view. So you'll notice the different tabs on the left side in the blue band that we could get to right now. And depending on what we have selected in our mailbox, some other items could become available here. We'll be revisiting backstage view during this course. To go back to your mailbox, you're going to click the left pointing arrow at the top of the blue band. Now we'll switch our focus to the left side of the screen. And that area is known as the folder pane. Now for myself, I actually have three different email addresses that come into Outlook. The email address that I'm going to be using during this course is the one that is expanded. When you have email addresses in Outlook, by default, they come with a set of folders. So you get an inbox, that's where your incoming mail goes into. You get a drafts folder, and that's if you're in the middle of composing an email and you're unable to finish it at that time or you want to finish it later, you can save it as a draft and it will be in the drafts folder. Sent items, pretty self-explanatory. Any email I send automatically goes into the sent items folder. Deleted items is explanatory as well. You have an archive folder. You'll learn about archiving a little bit later in the course. Conversation history. Junk email, which we'll talk about later as well. An outbox. Let's say you're offline. You're not connected to the internet and you send an email. It will be unable to send it, but it will hold it in the outbox until you have a connection. And then it will attempt to send it again. And you have search folders, which I'll cover a little bit later in the course as well. So those are the default folders that you get underneath any email address that you have in Outlook. You also may or may not have a groups folder. This is typically if you have SharePoint groups or Outlook 365 groups, excuse me, Microsoft 365 groups, they may show there. On the bottom of the folders pane, you have, in my case, three icons and an ellipsis button. So the first icon is an envelope and it's blue. It's highlighted, if you will. That means that you're currently in your inbox. The next one to the right is how you could navigate to your calendar. Then you have one that looks like two heads and that's how you can get to your contacts. Now that area can be customized, which I'll show you next. To customize that navigation panel on the bottom of the folder pane, you can click on the ellipsis to the right and you can see what it's showing there, right? Or other things that can show there. You can have tasks, notes, folders and shortcuts show there as well. What we're going to do is we're going to click on navigation options. And it's saying up here the maximum number of visible items. I'm going to change that to five. And I'm going to uncheck compact navigation. And then you can choose the order that you want things to be displayed in. So just for example, I'm going to click on tasks. And I'm going to use the move up button so it shows before people, which is your contacts list. And then I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So compact navigation is when you're seeing the icons and not the words of the Outlook items. If you want to leave it that way, you can. I'm going to go back to the ellipsis 
go back to navigation options, check compact navigation again, and click OK. I prefer to have it that way. Really, it is a personal preference. Whether it's compact or not, it still works in the same way. So if I wanted to go to my calendar, I would simply, I can hover over the second icon and it shows what's known as a peak of my monthly calendar for the current month and any appointments that I may have on it may show there as well. And then if I click on it, it actually opens the calendar. And so I'm going to go back to my mailbox by clicking the envelope icon down there. And if you want to gain more viewing space, you can collapse the folders pane by using the left pointing arrow that's in its upper right hand corner. So when you click that arrow, it collapses the folders pane. You'll see some of your folders there. And you notice the icons on the bottom are just in a vertical order as opposed to horizontal. You can expand it by using the now right pointing arrow. And then if you want it to stay expanded, you use the push pin in its upper right hand corner to pin the folder pane. The next section to the right of the folder pane is your actual inbox. And you can expand the width of your inbox if you'd like by using the divider line on its right side. You could also expand the width of your folder pane using the same method if necessary. Now in my inbox at the top, I have focused and then I have another tab called other. My inbox is sorted by date in descending order. And so th the inbox is also in what's known as a collapse state right now where I'm not seeing any emails. I'm just seeing today, yesterday, last week, two weeks ago. And to expand all of those categories, I can right click on any one of them and choose expand all groups. I can also right click on any one of them and choose collapse all groups, which is what my default setting was there. I'm going to expand today and I have one email from today. And when I click on it, the section to the right of the screen, which is your preview, section populates with the contents of the email. So I don't even have to open the email to read it. I can read it in this preview section. Notice at the top on the preview, it tells me who it's from, who it's to. Um, it says if there are any problems with how this message is displayed, I could view it in a web browser. I even have my reply, reply all forward buttons there. Underneath them is the date and time that the email came into my inbox. And then there's an other actions button where I can share it to teams. I can schedule a meeting forward as an attachment or have the message translated. Now, if I wanted to open the message, I could simply double click on it in my inbox and it opens in its own separate window. And this separate window actually has a little bit of a ribbon interface at the top of it. So I could go to the message tab in here. If I wanted to delete it, I have my respond group there, share to teams, quick steps, and you'll see the other groups that are there. I'm going to use the X in the upper right hand corner to close the email. And to complete our grand tour of the Outlook interface, we're going to focus our attention to the very bottom of the screen. You'll see a gray band going across the entire bottom of the screen. That is known as the status bar. And like in any other office program, if you right click in a blank area of the status bar, you can customize it to show all of the things on this list. So all of the things on my list are checked, meaning they'll show there. For example, the items in my view, I have 22 items in this inbox view. And the only thing that I have unchecked is quota information, which I don't necessarily need to see down there. But if I did want to see it, I would just click on it and then it would show down there. 
So it's letting me know how many gigabytes I have of free space. I'm going to click on it again to turn it off. Now over to the right of the status bar, you'll get some messages. It's letting me know that all folders are up to date and also that I'm connected in my case to Microsoft Exchange. I have a couple of view buttons to the right of those messages. The current view button, if I hover over it, it's normal view. The next one is reading view, which collapsed our folders pane. Now I can go back to normal view using its view button and my folders pane is no longer collapsed. And then I have a zoom slider like the other office programs. When I'm on an email or in an email, it will become active and I can zoom in and out on that email. Our next topic in this lesson is working with messages. So we're going to create a new email message. If you notice on the home tab of the ribbon, the first icon is new email. Go ahead and click it and an untitled message opens in its own separate window. You'll notice that the ribbon is different in the message window than it is in your main mailbox window. And we'll be using certain options on the ribbon throughout the course. I also want to point out that your insertion point is active in the to field. Your from field is populated with your email address. And you also have a CC and subject field on the upper half under the ribbon. The lower half, when you click in the lower half, you're in the body of the message, which is where you actually type your message. So I'm going to go back to the to field. And for the sake of this training, I'm going to send this message to myself. I understand that some people viewing this may not have another mailbox available in Outlook that they can send and receive from. So Outlook will allow you to send messages from yourself. If I have to demonstrate other features by using one of my other mailboxes, I will let you know when we get to that point in the course. So for right now, I'm going to start typing in my email address. And it's given me some suggestions, but I'm going to just keep typing it. And when I get it typed in, I can click on it. Or I could have just clicked in the subject line. I have this in Outlook as a contact. This email address is a contact. And when we get to the contacts portion of the course, you'll learn that you can either display the email address or you can assign a name to the contact and it can display both. In the subject, I'm going to just type first email in the Outlook 2021 video course. That's the subject. And then I click in the body. Going to just keep it simple here. You can type anything you'd like in the body of your message. Or you can copy what I'm typing. And if you notice to the left of your from to CC and subject areas, you have your send button. You're going to go ahead and click send. So when you receive a new email in your inbox, by default, it will be the top email in your inbox. And there are some visual cues that I'd like to point out to you that appear on your screen. First of all, to the right of the inbox in the folder pane, you'll see a blue number that indicates how many unread messages are in your inbox. When we reviewed the status bar earlier, you saw that I had everything displaying except quota information. And one of those things I chose to display was the number of unread messages in my inbox folder. Also, if you look at the new email in your inbox itself, 
You'll notice a couple of things about it. It has a blue banner on its left side. The subject line is bold and blue. And the time that the email arrived in your inbox is also displaying over on the right side of it. So those are your visual cues that you have unread mail in your inbox. Now I'm gonna display some default behaviors. If I click on that new email, as you saw earlier, I could read it over on the right side in the reading pane. Now, if I click on another email, the new email is no longer considered to be unread. If you click on it and then click away from it, it will automatically mark it as read. And in just a few seconds, the number one, and it just happened, will disappear from the right of your inbox folder. You won't see any unread mail message down in your status bar. And the message doesn't have the blue banner or the bolding or anything like that anymore. So earlier when we were doing our grand tour, I talked about the focus tab and there's an other tab. So Microsoft determines which emails are most important and will display them on the focus tab. Any other emails will be displayed on the other tab. And later in the course, I'll show you how you can make it not have a focus tab. So just every email is displayed in one section instead of having to go back and forth between the two. And now there's another way that you can start a new email message. Instead of clicking on the new email icon on the home tab of the ribbon, you can do control and the letter N on your keyboard, the shortcut key, control N, and it will give you an untitled message window. Now I'm gonna address this email to myself again. And because I'm so creative right now, I'm gonna go to the subject line and the subject is gonna be second email in the, and I can type Outlook 2021 video course. Now, I want you to type a sentence and purposely misspell a word. And you'll notice if you were watching my screen while I was typing, as soon as I misspelled typing and pressed my space bar, it gave me the wavy red underline like it does in Word. And then misspell, it actually autocorrect when I typed one S. So all of that happens by default. Now, those same kind of autocorrect and spell check features happen by default. One of the worst things that can happen, in my opinion, is you can send out an email and it's not spell checked. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. By default, it spell checks your email. It'll do spell and grammar checker as soon as you click on send. So I'm going to go ahead and click on send and my spell check comes up. So you really don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to take my suggestion, the second suggestion for typing and say change all. And then it went ahead and sent the email. I've marked my second email as read by clicking on it and then clicking away from it. And now I'm on the help tab of the ribbon. This is the third and final topic in this getting started with Outlook lesson. So we're going to talk about how you can get help in Outlook. The first thing you can do on this help tab is you can click the help button, which we're going to circle back around to, but there's more. You can contact support. You can give feedback to help improve office. You can even suggest a feature. You can get to some Microsoft trainings and there are support tools that can be accessed. And if you're an admin, there's notifications that can happen. There are also some diagnostic tools. We're going to click on the first icon, which is help. 
and it opens a panel on the right side of your screen. So it has categories here, get started, customize, so on and so forth. There has a video there showing a feature, right? Use instant search about searching and filtering email. If I scroll down to the bottom, there's featured help, video training at an email account, create and add a signature to messages. So you'll get comfortable using this or at the very top, there's a search box. So I'm going to click in the search box at the top and I'm going to type compose email and press enter. So it gives me the results. And at the bottom, there's even a show more link, meaning there's more that's not showing initially. Most of these are what are called articles. And there's some videos that are mixed in as well. If you want to see a video of somebody doing the thing that you're seeking help on. So the very first result, create, send, and reply to an email is good, right? So notice that's an active link. If I click on it, there's a video that I can look at, but it also gives me the step-by-step -step of how to do these things. So I have choices here. At the bottom, you know, Microsoft is always collecting information. So at the bottom, it says, was this information helpful? You can say yes or no. Now at the top, if I wanted to get back to the home screen for help, there's the little house to the left of the search box that I can click on and it takes you back to the home screen. And when I'm done using help over on its right, I can click the X to close that panel. So now we're on to lesson two, formatting messages. And we have three topics here. I'm going to learn a little bit more about adding message recipients. We already discussed how spelling and grammar check happen automatically when you press send, but I'm going to revisit some more options for that. And then you're going to learn how to format your message content. So now let's bring up another new email window and go ahead and address it to yourself. And you'll notice after you address it to yourself, and you may have to press your tab key to get this to happen, you'll see that it's followed by a semicolon. In my case, the name of my contact is followed by a semicolon. And the insertion point has advanced, so you have a space after the semicolon. And so it's ready for you to type in another email address. Now, in this case, I'm going to use a different email address here and type it in after the semicolon. Now that's how you add multiple recipients. You just keep typing the email address, or if you have them in your contacts list, your contact name, and they will show up in the two line. The same would be true for your CC box, and we don't have to do a CC here. So the subject of this email is going to be multiple recipients and message formatting. And you're going to click in the body of the message. Now you can type anything you'd like in the body of the message. Just misspell one or two words. So feel free to use what I typed in my message or do your own. And you can clearly see my typos. Now I'm kind of OCD. And if I was typing a long message, it would bother me that I have those wavy red underlines on my screen. And I don't want to wait until I click send to correct those spelling errors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the first wavy red underline. And it brings up like a spell check at the top of the shortcut menu. And it has the correct spelling for the word that I'm looking for before. So I'm going to just select the correct spelling. I'm going to right click on my second misspelled word and I'm going to select format for that. So I don't have to wait until I click send to get the grammar and spell check functionality 
and fix any spelling or grammar errors that get flagged in the email. So now I want to select the entire body of the message. I can click and drag to do that, but I love shortcut keys. So anywhere within the body of the message, I'm going to select, I'm going to hold down control and press the letter A. Control A means select all. And then just keeping in theme with shortcut keys. Now I could do this from the basic text group on the message tab of the ribbon, but I'm going to hold down control and I'm going to type B I and it bolded and italicized my font. And then I decide, well, I don't really want it bold. I just want it in italics. So I'm going to do control B and it gets rid of the bolding. But maybe I want my font to be in a different color. So in that basic text group on the message tab of the ribbon, I'm going to do the font color drop down and pick a color of your choice. And now we formatted a little bit of the message content. Now we're ready to go ahead and click send. I'm going to show you another way to mark a message as read. So I haven't clicked on that new multiple recipients message. I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to choose mark as read from the shortcut menu. So now I never clicked on that message, just a single click so I could read it in the reading pane. I never looked at the contents of that message. All I can see is the little preview that's here. So if it was much longer, I wouldn't be able to see it, but I'm able to mark it as read by right clicking on it. Let's bring up another new email and you'll see some other formatting choices that you have. Go ahead and address it to yourself. And the subject will be more formatting options. In the body, type a sentence or two. So I typed a couple of sentences. And I actually, and if you haven't, you can go ahead above your sentences, type like a heading or something. I just typed formatting options. Now we're going to go to the format text tab on the ribbon. And by the way, I didn't mention this before, but whatever you put in the subject line becomes the name of the message. So when you start a new message, it says untitled message. And now it says more formatting options, which is our subject line. So on that format text tab, you have a font group, just like you do on the message tab. You have a paragraph group, but you also get the styles group, which are very similar to using styles in Word. So what I'm going to do is I am going to select that first line formatting options in my message body. And in the styles group, I'm going to click on heading one. So you have some stylistic changes, just like you can do in Word. Now there are more styles showing if you wanted to see all of the styles. To the right of the styles gallery, you have a dimmed out up arrow, a down arrow, and then a down arrow with a line above it. That is known as the more button. If you click the more button, it opens up the entire gallery. So maybe I want to see what heading two would look like on formatting options or title. And I think titles a little bit too big could go with subtitle. So pick a style that makes sense to you here for that first heading. And then it gave me that heading in like a blue font. So I'm going to select my other content in that message body. And I'm going to go to the font color drop down in the font group. And I'm going to select a slightly darker blue color. So it just gives the message a little bit more visual interest to use those formatting options. And you can go ahead and send your message. Our third lesson in module one 
is working with attachments and illustrations. So you're going to learn how to attach files and outlook items to messages, how to add illustrations to messages and how to manage automatic message content in this lesson. Before we dive in, I want to point out a discrepancy on my screen and explain why it's that way. So you'll notice all of the emails that we've done for this course are now under my yesterday group in my inbox. And that's because I stopped recording this video last night and resumed recording this evening. So now they're under yesterday. And that explains the discrepancy on my screen. Let's go ahead and open a new email message. And I'm going to address it to myself. And for the subject line, I'm going to type working with an attachment. And then I'm going to do a dash and type via ribbon. I'm going to click in the body and type something like, please, review the attached. Now there are two different ribbon tabs that you can use when you're in a message, a new message window to attach a file to the message. And one is on the message tab, the default tab that you're already on. In the include group, you have an attach file button. It also gives you the ability to attach an outlook item or a business card. You can browse your OneDrive locations, or you could browse this PC from that drop down. I'm going to click away from it. I'm going to go to the insert tab on the ribbon. And I'm going to, the first button is attach file. So here they just have browse web location and browse this PC because they have a separate item, the second one on this ribbon tab, Outlook item, they made that a separate thing. You can also drag and drop files onto an email. So since we're on the Insert tab, let's go to Attach File and choose Browse This P PC. And I'm navigating to the folder I created where I put the files from the video description into this one folder on my PC. So the file that we want to attach is a Word document. It's called Outlook 2021 Course Description. You can click on the checkbox in front of it and then choose Insert in the lower right corner, or you can just double click it to insert it. And it shows up underneath your subject line. And notice there's a drop down arrow next to it. Let's say you attach something by accident. You can remove the attachment. You can save it as something else. You can upload it to OneDrive. You can open it, cut, copy, all of these different things. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and click send. You can see that when you receive a file with an attachment, it has that paper clip icon to the right. So that's your visual cue that there is an attachment with that email. Now what you can do, go ahead and select that email. What can you do with the attachment? Well, you can do the drop down arrow and you saw this menu before and you can open it if it's an attachment that you want to save, I would detach it from my email and save it to my computer. One of the things that uses up the quota in your email are large attachments. So it's a good habit to get into. If it's something that you need to keep, then you can do save as, and you'll be able to browse to a directory on your computer to save it. I'm not going to actually save it because it's already on my computer. And if you don't want to keep it, you can review it by opening it or previewing it and then remove the attachment. So it's no longer taking up space in your email. 
If you have multiple attachments on an email, you can save all of them to your computer at the same time by using save all, or you might want to upload them to your OneDrive account. So what we're going to do now is open up another new email. We're not going to use the ribbon for this particular email. We're going to use the drag and drop method. So go ahead and address the email to yourself. And the subject line is going to be working with an attachment dash via drag and drop. And I'm going to use the same sentence here. Please review the attached. Now at this point, I'm going to arrange my windows. I'm going to go up in my main outlook window where my inbox is. I'm going to just minimize that. And I already have the folder open where I have the files from the video description. So I'm going to just arrange these windows side by side. Now I'm working in Windows 11, so I can go up here to the maximize button and choose the right half of the screen. And then on the left half, I can just, oops, I did the wrong thing. The file folder is what I wanted. So there it is. So when the windows are arranged where you can see one or the other, they don't necessarily have to be side by side, you can drag and drop. So the file that we want this time is Excel Essentials, and I'm just dragging it into the body of my email message. And you'll notice that my mouse pointer looks like it has a box attached to it. I'm going to just let go, and it attaches the file. I can maximize my message window again. And then I can go ahead and click Send. So the new emails in my inbox, I'm going to select it. And in the email, when I click on the attachment, you'll notice this time I didn't click on the down arrow. I clicked on the attachment and it shows me a preview of the information. If you just click on the attachment. And also when you have the attachment active, like we do now, or if you had access to drop down arrow, next to it, it changes to the attachments tab on the ribbon where a lot of the stuff that's on the right click menu is there. So you can see that on the attachments ribbon. Notice at the top of the preview, it says back to message. So I'm going to click that and it takes me back to the regular email. And then I'm going to click away from it to mark it as red. So the two that we just did are both marked as red. Now we're going to create another new email to which we're going to attach an Outlook item. An Outlook item, well, hang on a second. I'd rather show you than tell you. So let's get a new email message going and address it to yourself. And this time the subject will be attaching an Outlook item. I'm going to use the same language in the body. Please see attached or please review attached. And on the message tab in the include group, I'm going to go ahead and click on attach file, hover over attach item. We're not going to do business card because we haven't learned how to produce them yet. That's later in the course. We're going to choose Outlook item. Now, because I have multiple mailboxes, I'm going to switch to the mailbox that I'm using for this course. And you can see that an Outlook item can be anything in any of your Outlook folders. So it could be an email in your inbox or a draft email if you have any, something from your sent items or deleted items if it hasn't been emptied, archive items. You can even grab appointments from your calendar and attach them. You can attach contact information, all of these things. We're going to leave it on inbox and I'm going to just select an email I received from a vendor. And before I do that, look to the right underneath. Okay. And cancel buttons. 
By default, it will insert an item as an attachment. Your other choice is text only. We're going to leave it on attachment. And you can select any email that you want, even if it's one that you sent to yourself. And then I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So it attached the email like any other attachment, same drop down next to it. And we can go ahead and send. The second part of this lesson, the second topic I should say, is adding illustrations to messages. Go ahead and start a new message window, address it to yourself, and use the subject line adding illustrations to messages. So once I click in the message body, I'm going to go to the insert tab on the ribbon. And you'll notice that on the insert tab, you have an illustrations group. So illustrations can be anything from pictures to 3D models, shapes, icons, so on and so forth. We're going to start with a picture that we had in a video description file called Learn It Logo. So I'm going to go to the pictures drop down and choose insert picture from this device. We'll review the other two options momentarily. And I've already navigated to the folder I created with the files from the video description. And I'm going to just double click that Learn It logo. Now, after I have it in the body, I'm going to click after it in the body and I'm going to press enter twice. Let's go back to insert, back to pictures. And this time let's go to stock images. Now notice across the top, and I'm going to move this window down just a little bit so I can see the ribbon behind it. It has icons up here. That's the same as if you click icons on the ribbon. But right now we're looking at images. There are icons. There are cut out people. Stickers. Illustrations. And cartoon people. Let's go back to images. And each of those have different subcategories. So communication, paper, symbol, so on and so forth, all of these categories. Or you can just click in the search box. Let's click in the search box and type um, computer and press enter. So you get all of these different images that come up for computer. And one thing I want to point out is in the bottom left corner, it says this is a subset of the creative content library. The full library is available to Microsoft 365 subscribers, other subscribers and stuff like that. You can learn more about it. In basic terms, it means that you can use most of these pictures without violating copyright. So you can select any image that you like just by clicking on it. And then you'll notice the insert button has the number one behind it, meaning you selected one image. And I'm going to go ahead and click insert. Now the image came into the email really big, right? But if you look at the ribbon, you now have a picture format contextual tab because the picture comes in and it's still selected. So on that tab, all the way over to the right, you'll see the height and the width boxes. Click in the width box and type five and press enter. And it, it, it adjusted the height accordingly. Now, I don't know if you've worked with images in other office programs. What I'd like you to do is click in a blank area to the right of the image and you'll see your insertion point flashing on the bottom right edge of the image. Go ahead and press enter twice. You have to be careful when working with images where you are when you're pressing enter. Um, it could move the image itself down. So I wanted to point that out. And now just to finish up our pictures, let's modify our subject line. At the end of it, type a dash 
and type pictures. And then you can click back in your body of the email underneath that stock image. We're going to go back to insert pictures. And this time we're going to choose online pictures. So it's powered by Bing search, right? You'll see all the categories that you have here, or you can search for a picture. It's really hot where I am right now. So I'm going to click on the ice cream category. And so now here, when you go in, you have a filter already set that says creative commons only. Again, most of these items are available for your use without violating copyright, but you also have the learn more here link at the bottom. So I'm going to just select an ice cream that looks good to me. And actually, yeah, I'll just select one. I won't be greedy here and I'll click the insert button. And again, as with the other picture, I'm going to go change the width to five and press enter. And now we can go ahead and click send. Go ahead and create another new email address to yourself. And the subject for this one will be adding illustrations to messages, 3d models. We're going to just do one 3d model here. It's a really cool feature. So I'm in the body and I'm going to go to insert in the illustrations group. I'm going to select the arrow for 3d models and choose stock 3d models. You'll see that they are categorized, right? All these different categories and everything. And you can also search up here. We're going to look for a category called Microsoft products and they have laptops, game controllers, all of this stuff. going to have you select a laptop and then go ahead and click insert. Now, sometimes it may seem like it's never going to insert the 3d model. Sometimes it gets hung up. So if that happens to you, you want to click away from that window and then back into it. Notice once your 3D model is inserted, you have that 3D model tab on your ribbon. And also right in the center of the 3D model, there's a symbol. You're going to put your mouse on that symbol, click and hold. And now you can start dragging the model around in a 3D dimension. So you can see the bottom, the top, the back, the left, that. Ladies and gentlemen is a 3d model. Go ahead and send this message. Our last topic in this lesson is managing automatic message content. I'm going to show you two ways to do that. So go ahead and bring up a new email, address it to yourself and the subject will be auto text. Let's say that you have to send the same email out over and over again. I'll use a scenario where it's, you have weekly departmental meetings and you need to send the minutes out to everybody in the department every week and you use the same boilerplate text. So we're going to type in the body of this email, we're going to type, please review attached minutes. And then we're going to do control a to select that text. You're going to go to the insert tab of the ribbon and over to the right, you'll see the text group. And so these are very similar to the text group in Microsoft word. And what we're going to select is quick parts hover over auto text and then click on save selection to auto text gallery. So you can name it. It's going to take the first few words of what you type to give it a name. And we're going to say 
minutes email text. That's what we're going to name it. And we're going to just click OK. You don't have to put a description. We'll leave it in a general category. You could create other categories. It's going into the auto text gallery, which is where you would want it to be. It's being saved in the normal email template. And at the bottom, you have options, insert content only, insert content in its own paragraph or on its own page. In our case, it doesn't matter. It's just one line of text. So we're gonna leave it on insert content only and click okay. Now, I'm gonna have you close that email. Don't save the changes and bring up another new email. This time, click right in the body and you're gonna to go to the insert tab. In the text group, you're gonna to go to quick parts, hover over auto text, and you'll see your minutes email text. Click it and it inserts that. So it could very well be that you have paragraphs of text that you insert into a lot of emails or that you've been typing into a lot of emails. I would use quick parts in auto text if I have a limited amount of text and you'll see why in a moment, but in the meantime, go ahead and address this email to yourself with a subject of auto text and send it. We're not going to actually attach anything. So this is a really cool reminder that comes up. We said, please review attached minutes. Outlook saw the word attached and realized we didn't attach a file. So it gives us a reminder. And we could say don't send and then attach a file or send anyway. This comes in so handy for me. Sometimes like in this case, we're purposely not going to attach anything, but sometimes I just simply forget the attachment and I'm so grateful for this reminder. So I never click don't show this message again. That's just my personal preference. I'm gonna choose send anyway. So I said that I typically use auto text for short text blocks, right? If it's longer, like paragraphs full of text, then I use the feature that I'm gonna introduce you to now, which is message templates. But back in the day before they had message templates, I would often use auto text for paragraphs of text that I use repeatedly in different messages. So you can use the feature that way. Let's bring up a new email. You know the drill, address it to yourself. And this one's gonna be called message templates as a subject. If you look at the last button on the message tab of the ribbon, you have view templates. Click on that. So by default, it gives you a couple of default templates. I'll reply later, heading to a meeting, I'll get back to you soon, I'm running late, lunch. But you can create your own. So let's create a template by clicking that link. And we'll name it default invoice text. And then in a the text box underneath that, you're gonna type Please see my attached invoice. It's been a pleasure doing business with you, period. Enter, enter, next paragraph. If you want to extend your service agreement, please contact us via the form on our website. And then we'll just leave it like that. No, we'll do enter, enter, and then we'll type, type thank you. And then save it. So whenever you open a new email message, when you go to view templates, your default invoice template will be at the top of the list. 
they put them in alphabetical order. So in this case, it'd be at the top of the list. But if you scroll back down to the bottom of the list, you can add more templates. So you, if you're in a situation where you send many emails and they have the same message over time, you can just save that message as a template. Notice if you hover over the default invoice, you can delete it or you can edit it if you see something that needs to be changed. What we're going to do is we're going to just click on it and see how it inserts it into the body of the email and go ahead and click send. It's going to say again, you may have forgotten. We're going to send it anyway. Our last lesson in this module is customizing message options. We'll learn how to customize reading options, how to track messages, and how to recall and resend messages. I'm going to go ahead and select my message templates email. And we're going to get into customizing your reading options. So let's go to the view tab on the ribbon. And first thing I want to say about the view tab is when we did the overview of the interface here, we talked about how we have a focused inbox where Outlook determines which messages are important and then all other messages go to other. If you don't want to see your focused inbox, you can on the view tab, just click on show focused inbox and then it gives you an all category and then an unread category. And so that's just a personal choice you can make. Now, the other thing I want to go to is over on the right, you have a layout group and in the layout group, you'll see your reading pane drop down, reading pane drop down. So by default, the reading pane shows on the right. Some people like to have it on the bottom of the screen. I prefer it on the right. Your only other choice there is to turn it off. And so you no longer have a reading pane. I'm going to go back to reading pane and choose right again. And if you go back to reading pane one more time and you go to options at the bottom and you'll see some of these options a little bit later in the course, right? But this is why when we've been selecting an item, reading it in the reading pane and then clicking on another email, it marks the item as red. So mark item as red when selection changes is what's causing that behavior. We can just cancel out of there. And we also discussed how my inbox groups are automatically collapsed. I'm going to show you how you can make that happen in your inbox as well. So also on the view tab, you're going to click on the second button in the current view group, view settings. In view settings, you're going to click on group by on the left. And then in the bottom right, you'll see where it says expand collapse defaults. Mine are all collapsed, right? Yours is probably on as last viewed. So if you want it to always be all collapsed or all expanded, you can change it here. And if you have multiple mailboxes in here, you have to do that setting for each mailbox because it's in the current view group. I'm going to expand my today and my yesterday groups in my inbox. And so in what you can do here, if you look at the preview, you're only seeing two lines in your preview on the view tab in the arrangement group, you'll see message preview. You might want the message preview to be off or one line or I'm going to change mine to three lines. And when I go to make a change, it asks me if I want to do it just in this folder and on all mailboxes, I'm going to choose this folder. So now when I expand, if there are three lines in the more three or more lines in the email, I can at least see three of them just a little bit more. 
Now, there may be times when you will want to track a message. You can track a message for two things to see whether it has been received and or whether it has been read. So let's bring up a new email window. Now I'm going to address this to a different email address of mine. The delivery receipt, if you address it to yourself, you will get the delivery receipt, but you may or may not get the read receipt. So if you have another email address to use, use it. If not, address it to yourself and you'll see on my screen what happens. And this one's going to be a subject of tracking messages. And I'm going to type, I am going to track this message for delivery and reading options. And now I'm going to go to the options tab on the tracking messages ribbon. And on the options tab, you have a tracking group and right there, you can check the two boxes, request a delivery receipt, request a read receipt. Before we send this message, let me tell you what those options do. The delivery receipt is usually the first one you will receive back in your inbox. It just means that the email has been delivered to the recipient's inbox. And actually I forgot to use a different email, so I'll change this here. So you'll get an email back saying that the delivery was successful. Well, and this again, some companies require both of these to be used. I very rarely use a delivery receipt and this is why. If I send you an email and for some reason it doesn't get to you, I automatically get a system administrator email back letting me know that delivery was unsuccessful for the following recipients. So. Delivery receipt just says it hits the person's inbox. The read receipt means they read the email. Technically speaking, that's not always what it responds to. Remember, if I click on this email, even if I don't read it in the reading pane, and then I click on a different email, it marks that as read. As soon as it's marked as read is when the system will send you the read receipt. So keep that in mind. Go ahead and send this email. Now I'm going to switch to my other email account that is the recipient and I'm going to double click that email just to open it, close it. Now it's marked as red, right? And so I'm going to go back to my training inbox that I've been using. And I got my delivered message and I should be getting the read receipt soon. So it just says your message has been delivered and then it'll say your message has been read by the following recipients when it comes in. So that's how you can track messages. If you want to track messages all the time, like every message that you send, you can set those options globally so you don't have to do it on a message by message basis. And then it will happen for every message automatically. And you'll learn how to do that later in this course. For right now, you're going to learn how to recall and then resend messages. Let's go ahead and do a new message window. I'm going to use another email address for this one as well for the recall portion. So I'm going to put in another email and then the subject line will be recalling messages. Now there is a caveat to this feature. I can only recall a message that hasn't been read by the recipient. So be careful with this. You may not always be able to recall your messages. If you are successful, then the actual message disappears from the recipient's inbox like it was never there. So we're going to type a message, just a short couple of sentences here, and then we'll, I'll give you a scenario that has happened to me in the past. So I'm going to type, you requested that I give you the data for the first 
quarter. And here it is, colon. Then I'll enter twice. And I'll type, I'm just making up names, Evans, and I'll just do a dash and say that he's $10,132, like sales money. Then I press enter. And then my phone rings and I get involved on the call and I have to go over to a different application. And for some reason, I click send on this message that I have not completed. So go ahead and click send. Now, as long as the recipient doesn't read it, right? As long, so I'll go in my other mailbox that I sent it to. And I'm not going to click on that message at all. If I do and then I click somewhere else, it marks it as read and I won't be able to recall it. So what I need to do in order to recall a message is I need to go to my sent items folder from the account that I sent the message from expand it and open the message that I sent the recalling messages message. I'm opening it from sent items. Then I'm going to go to the file tab of that message and you'll see resend or recall right there. We're going to click on resend or recall. We're going to choose recall this message. And so, some recipients may have already read this message. That's just standard. It doesn't mean that they have. Message recall can delete or replace copies of this message in recipient inboxes if they have not yet read this message. Are you sure you want to delete unread copies of this message? And that's the setting we want. And then the check mark by default, tell me if recall succeeds or fails for each recipient. We're going to leave that checked. Go ahead and click OK. It lets you know at the top of the sent item that you tried to recall this message and it gives you the date and the time. We're going to close that sent item. And I'm going to go to my inbox. And I get my message recall success message. And it lets me know. So if I had sent that message to 10 recipients and five of them read the message, I would get five that it was a success and five emails that it failed. That's kind of how that works. Now, the other thing you can do is resend a message. So let's go ahead and do another new email. I'm going to address it to my other email account. And the subject is simply going to be resend. And I'm going to just type, and this scenario would be like, I start the message and then I realized that I forgot to put a key thing in it or something like that. I don't necessarily want to recall it. I just want to resend it after updating it. So I'm going to just type Trish. Here is the info you requested. And I'll put something like Olive Garden Thursday. Press enter and click send. And just like recalling, you're going to go to your sent items. You're going to open up the message with the subject resend. Go to the file tab. You're going to click on resend or recall. And it says for recent, send a message again with the option to update content or change recipients. So I bring it up and it lets me update the content and or change the recipients. So Olive Garden Thursday, and then underneath that, I'm going to type meeting with Jason at 1230 p.m. And then I'm going to go ahead and click send. I'm going to close my original sent item. So now we're ready for module two in this introductory portion of Outlook, and we'll be drilling down into managing Outlook. 
This module will introduce the tools that help organize your messages, manage your contacts, and schedule meetings appointments on your calendar. The learning outcomes here will be that you can create folders, categories, and mark messages. You can add and edit contacts. You'll have the ability to schedule appointments, events, or meetings, and you'll be able to save notes and create tasks associated with an email. We have four lessons in this module. The first lesson will be about organizing messages. In lesson six, we'll start dealing with contacts. Lesson seven, we'll start working with the calendar. And the final lesson will work with task and notes. In the first lesson, organizing messages, you'll learn how to mark and categorize messages and also how to organize messages using folders. Just like everything else in Outlook, there are multiple ways that you can mark messages. Let's start by doing it from our inbox. So I'm going to hover over the message templates message. And on the right hand side above the time, you'll see a flag. Now, what I'm going to have you do instead of just clicking on the flag, right click on the flag. If you just click on the flag, it would flag the message or mark it for today. Meaning you want to follow up on it in some way and you want to follow up on this day. You can see the other time frames. You can put no date on it or you can choose a custom date that's not on the list. So these are how you can flag or mark your messages. We're going to go ahead and choose tomorrow for that one. And so visually you'll see that the flag and they're color coded, but you'll see the flag on the message indicating that it has been marked. Another way to mark a message is let's go to the attaching an outlook item message and just select it. And then on the home tab of the ribbon in the tags group, you can go to follow up and it's the same as using the flag in the inbox. And this one will say next week. Now there's a secondary thing that happens when you mark your messages and you'll see that a little bit later in this module. Marking messages is one way that you can organize your messages. Categorizing them is another way. So let's select the messages. Well, we're going to select the message, adding illustrations to messages. You can just click on that to select it and hold down your shift key and click on the one underneath it, adding illustrations to messages, pictures. So we have both of those 3D models and picture messages selected. Now on the home tab of the ribbon in the same tags group where we went to follow up, you're going to click on categorize. So they have six categories and they're just called whatever their color is. So blue category, green category, whatever. And we're going to select blue category. And we can change the name of it because this is the first time you're using it. You can change the name here and we're going to call this illustrations. We'll leave the color blue. We're not going to give it a shortcut key. We're just going to click on yes. So if you notice the one that's the 3d model message is the one that's being displayed in the reading pane underneath the subject, it shows the category and you can sort your inbox, which you'll learn how to do later. You can sort by category. You can sort by marking messages, all kinds of things. So another way of organizing your inbox. So we use the shift key 
to select two adjacent messages. If I click on any other message, it will deselect them. Let's say you wanted to select the first message, meaning the top one in your inbox and the third one. If you click on the top one, you can hold down your control key and click on the third one. And you can hold down control and click on the fifth, any random messages that you would want to select. I just thought I would mention that. Just click on any message to deselect them. Another way you can organize your messages is by using folders. So we're going to create a folder underneath our inbox. So in effect, a subfolder. We'll actually create two. So the way to do that is by right clicking on your inbox in your folder pane and choose new folder. And just to name it, we're going to just call it manager. And then we're going to click away from it. We're going to go back and right click on the inbox again and choose new folder again. And this one we'll call training and press enter. So we'll organize them underneath the inbox slightly indented in alphabetical order. And if you do the collapse arrow in front of the inbox, you'll just see your inbox and not the folders that are underneath it. And you can expand it by using the right arrow. So we're going to just manually move a couple of our messages, a couple of our emails to those folders. Let's select, we'll select the first two messages. And you're going to click on hold on either one of them and drag them on top of the manager folder. And now if you go to your manager folder and you expand today, you'll see those two messages. We're going to go back to our inbox, expand today. And we'll just leave one of these messages or three of these messages in our inbox. So we're going to select the first message. We're going to select using our control key, both of the categorized messages as well as the other flagged message. We're going to click and hold on any of those selected and drag them into the training folder. Now, later on in the course, you'll learn how to make stuff like that happen automatically. Like if an email comes in from training, it will automatically go into the training folder, stuff like that. So that's later in the course. So we created those folders, right? Now, this is what I'd like us to do. Let's bring up a new email and go ahead and address it to yourself. And you're going to use the subject search folders. We'll just type search folders are a very useful tool for organizing messages. And you're going to go ahead and click send. Now, when that message comes into your inbox, don't select it. We want to leave it unread. We're going to do one more new email addressed to yourself with the subject search folders to. For this one, I'm going to type please review attachment. And I'm going to go ahead and attach that word document that we brought in from the video description. Go ahead and send it. And again, don't click on it. So it will remain unread. So in addition to the folders we created underneath our inbox, there is an outlook feature known as search folders, and they really pull it all together. So imagine this scenario. We 
did two subfolders underneath our inbox. Imagine you had 25 subfolders. And I've already mentioned that later on in the course, you'll learn how to get emails as soon as they come in to go to a particular folder when you learn how to create rules. But right now you can drag and drop them as you saw. So search folders, if you had 25 folders and all of them were getting emails automatically sent into them every day, each folder would have the number behind it or next to it with the number of unread messages. It doesn't seem really efficient for you to have to go from folder to folder to be able to access those messages. That's one use of search folders that we're going to get into now. So after all of your folders, you'll see search folders in your folder pane, and you're going to right click on search folders, and you're going to choose new search folder. So they have search folders categorized. There's ones that are categorized as reading mail. So unread mail, mail flagged for follow-up, mail either unread or flagged for follow-up, and important mail. So we're going to leave it on unread mail, but let's look at what else is on this list. You have mail from and to specific people, mail from specific people, mail sent directly to you, meaning you're not like a CC or a BCC, mail sent to public groups. Organizing mail, you have categorized mail, large mail, and you get to determine the size of the large mail. If you click on large mail for a moment, it defaults to 100 kilobytes, but on the right side, you can choose and you can change the size that you want it to be greater than. We're going to cancel out of there. Old mail, and you can show the time period, older than one week is the default. Mail with attachments, mail with specific words, and then you also have the ability to create a custom search folder going to go all the way back up to the top, click on unread mail and click OK. Now notice you're in the unread mail search folder and it has the number two to the right. Well, we have two unread items. If we go click on our inbox and expand today, we have two unread items in our inbox. So it's almost like a mirror image. They're separate items. So this is what happens. If I go back to my unread mail search folder, expand the inbox, it's telling me where these items reside. They reside in my inbox. I'm going to click on the bottom one, then the top one, then the bottom one to mark them both red. My unread mail no longer has a number behind it. And if I go to my inbox and expand today, both of those items are marked as red. So I have one location to go to for all of my unread mail. And that would include the subfolders under the inbox. So let's do this. Let's do another new email, address it to yourself. And the subject will be manager. And I'm going to just type, this goes in the manager folder and send it and don't mark it as read. And then you're going to do another new email to yourself with the subject of training. And this goes in the training folder. So I have my two emails. This goes in the manager folder. So I'd like you to drag and drop it into your manager folder and drag and drop the other one into your training folder. And so you'll see the unread markers next to each folder. And you now have two unread mail items in your search folder. And we're going to add another search folder, the unread mail one and the one we're getting ready to add are ones that I highly recommend. So right click on search folders again, new search folder. And we're going to go down under organizing mail and choose mail with attachments and click okay. 
So I mentioned earlier when we started working with attachments that those, you know, large attachments or emails with attachments, they tend to eat up space in your mailbox quota. And once you hit your quota, you'll start receiving emails saying you're nearing your quota. And if you do nothing about it, you will be unable to get new mail in your inbox. And so if you're not detaching the attachments as you receive them, having this with attachments search folder is a handy way to find all of the emails with attachments, regardless of what folder they actually reside in so you can detach or remove those attachments. Go ahead and send yourself an email with an attachment and you will see that it will show up in your inbox as well as in the with attachments search folder. So you can see I have the email in my inbox as well as in the with attachments folder. And it's letting me know that I have one unread one with attachments in my inbox. I also have some red ones in my sent items and training folders. Pretty cool. I'm not going to go back to the slideshow for lesson six. It's title is managing your contacts and it only has one topic, which is create and edit contacts. And that's what we're going to get into now. So I just expanded the width of my folder pane a little bit so I could see all five icons at the bottom. And my people icon, looks like two heads, is in the fourth position. I'm going to go ahead and click it. And when I click it on the left side, it shows my default mailbox, and then it shows the mailbox that I'm using for training, which has no contact lists in it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a contact. So the first button when you're in this view, your people view, you have your new group, you have new contact, new group, new contact group, and new items. We're gonna just click on new contact. And you can put yourself in as a contact if you have like another email address or you can make up a contact name. I'm going to go ahead and say that my contact's name is Charles Connor. I can put in a company name here. job title. Now where it says file as the default is last name, you know, comma first name. If you do the drop down, you can see other ways that it can be filed. Now put in an email. And then you get to display as when you click in there, it's going to want to put the email. I'm going to just change it to Charles. And that's why you've been seeing Trish and you've been seeing training instead of the email address because of the display as field. I could put a web page address. I'm going to put um, www.google.com and tab away from that. Now notice on the right, it's building like a business card, right? I'm going to go down to the business numbers and I'm going to just put 333-333-3333. You could capture other numbers as you can see. And you can put, put in a business address and I'm going to just put 147 West 147th Street. And I'll just do New York. New York 10047. Don't know if it's a real address, right? Notice to check mark this is the mailing address. Now in a little while I'll show you how to use the map it feature. I don't know if this is a real address, but I have a real address that we're going to use in a little while. If I had a photo for this contact, I could just click on the add contact photo 
and I don't have one, right? I'll just put in, it went to my pictures, but I'll just use the PowerPoint logo or a logo I developed in PowerPoint, something like that. And then in the upper left corner of the contact window, you're gonna save and close. So now we're gonna add two more contacts and we're gonna use an, an Outlook feature, an efficiency feature, where you can add multiple contacts from the same company. So let's go back to our new group and choose new contact again. And we'll name this person John Smith. And the company we're gonna put Empire State Building. Job title, we'll say he's head engineer. I'm just making this up except for Empire State Building and the address. His email is gonna be John S at EmpireState.com. And I don't think that's a real email address. We wanna display him as John Smith. I like to display by first name, last name, or department names, things of that nature. And we'll just give them a web address of www.empirestate.com. Not sure if it's real. John gets a make-believe phone number. It's gonna be all sevens. And the business address is going to be real. I'm gonna make sure that box is checked that this is the mailing address as well. So it's gonna be 350 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10118. And at this point, if you click on map it, go ahead and click on map it. It opens up a browser window with the Bing, Microsoft Bing map page. You can zoom in and zoom out, things to do in the area nearby, things of that nature. And you can go ahead and close that browser window. And we're gonna click save and close. Now we wanna make sure in our list that John Smith is selected. Oh, I, don't mean, I don't mean to open him, I just want him to be selected. And this time in the new group, we're gonna go to the new items dropdown and choose contact from the same company. And so it brings over the company name, the file as, the web address, the business number, and the address. So we just gotta create another person. And this person is gonna be Richard Johnson His uh, job title is Engineer One. Email Richard J at EmpireState.com. Display as, I'm gonna make it Richard Johnson. And we're gonna leave the same phone and address and just save and close. So if you're entering multiple contacts from the same company, you enter the first one, make it select, make sure it is selected. And then you would go to new items like we did and choose contact from the same company. Now, while we're sitting here, we have three contacts. And right now our current view is people view. Click on the next view, business card. The next one is just card. Then you have a phone view and a list view. Yeah. I kind of like people view for the most part, just my personal preference. And let's say that we're looking at our list and we realize that we have the email address for Charles Connor wrong. To edit a contact, you can simply double click it. And we're gonna go to the email address and it's actually the number one, charlie 
at gmail.com. And you can just make your change and go back to save and close. Now you also have on, when you're in the contact, you have delete, you can save this one and create a new one. And you can do the drop down there and choose contact from the same company. So you don't have to keep opening new contact windows. You can forward it. You can send it to OneNote. You can email the contact. You can request a meeting with the contact. There's more there. If you have your phone on your computer set up, you can call the contact, all of that stuff. You can see the business card. You can go add a picture from here and you can also categorize contacts and flag them or mark them just like we did messages. You can also make it a private contact. Now updating, will update this contact with details from your organization's contact address book. So organization wide, you have an address book but you also have your own individual contacts and then you can zoom and you know, you have your regular insert format text review tabs up there. So you can do spell checks and all of that stuff for your contacts. I'm going to go back to the contact tab and save and close. And you can see the updated email address right in the list. You'll learn how to import and export contacts in the advanced modules in this course. Right now, we're going to switch to lesson seven, which is working with the calendar, where we will view the calendar, create appointments, schedule meetings, and you'll also learn the print options for the calendar. So we're going to get started by viewing the calendar. And on the bottom of your folder pane on the left side, you can click the second icon in my case, which is the calendar. Note a few things. Take a look at the home tab of the ribbon. When you're in calendar view, you get new appointment, new meeting, new items. If you are connected with teams, you can go into teams from here, meet now or schedule a new teams meeting from in here. You have a go to section where you can go to today or see the next seven days. And then it's the view that you're looking at. Mine is set to go into work week view, but you have day view, week view, which includes your Saturday and Sunday, month view, and also schedule view. I'm going to go back to work week view. You have a manage calendar. Um, section here on the ribbon. You can email your calendar. You can share your calendar. You can do calendar permissions and you'll learn how to give permissions later in this course. You could also get to your address book from that home tab. On the left side, you'll see a mini calendar for the current and the next month. And then underneath that, you have any calendars that you may have access to under calendars and then shared calendars, other calendars, and all of that stuff. So I'm on my calendar that's corresponding with the email address that I'm using for training. And you can see, and later on when we go into some Outlook settings, I'll show you how to do this. I have two time zones on my calendar. You probably only have one, and it's just, it doesn't even really have a label. So you'll learn how to do that later in the course. But right now I'm going to show you two ways of creating appointments. So just like when we were in our inbox, when we were in our inbox and we did control N, we got a new email message. When you're in your calendar view, if you do control and the letter N, you will get a new appointment window. So notice, it's untitled, just like we would get an untitled message, right? We can give it a title, the start and end date and times. You can show the time zone if you want. If you don't want to see the time zones, it can be unchecked over here. You can make it an event by making it an all day thing. You can make appointments recurring. Let's call this one water office plants. It's really more of a, like a task, but we want it on our calendar. 
And so we're going to just put the location as office and we'll change the date to like two days from today or two next business day after two days from today, whatever your today is. And I'm going to set it for 9 a.m. And it should take me a half hour. I'll leave it like that. And I'm going to save and close. And so it shows up on my calendar. Now, I decide I should really do that every Friday. So I'm going to double click that appointment on my calendar. And I'm going to select the make recurring link. And it's going to recur weekly under the recurrence pattern on Fridays. And I'll just give it no end date down in the bottom right and click OK. And now I'm going to save and close. So now if you look at our little mini calendars on the left, you'll notice that every Friday going forward is bold. If I click on August 12th on the calendar or a different Friday from whichever week you're in, you'll see the item on the calendar. Go back to today. So let's go back to our inbox for a moment. I'm going to show you another way of making an appointment. So I'm going to just switch back to the inbox. And let's bring up a new email. And send it to yourself and put on it request for meeting as the subject line. And I'm going to just type, Hey Trish, can we get together next Wednesday at four to discuss proposal? And I'll just sign it Marge. I don't know who Marge is, but she works in this situation. Go ahead and send the message. So what you're going to learn here is a new efficiency tip. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to right click on our calendar icon at the bottom of the folders pane. You're going to right click on it and you're going to choose open in new window. So now you have your inbox in one window, your calendar in the other. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my inbox window and I'm going to show it on the left side of my screen and then my calendar on the right. So I have them side by side. And on my calendar, I'm going to navigate using the mini calendar to the next Wednesday. And I'm going to click and hold on that request for meeting email in my inbox. And I'm going to drag it onto my calendar or I'm going to attempt to <laughs> drag it onto my calendar at the Wednesday 4 p.m. mark. And it opens up. It gives me the title, which is the subject of the email. It gives me a default half hour starting at 430. I'm going to make that an hour. And it has the body of the email, including the from sent the header stuff in this. So imagine somebody sends you an email and they're like, Hey, can we get together next Wednesday at four and discuss these topics? You can go ahead and drag and drop that email into the request for meeting. Now this comes up as an appointment. And so you're going to learn how to schedule a meeting in just a second, but we'll leave this as an appointment. Go ahead and do save and close. And then what I'm going to do is just maximize my calendar window. So now that we're in our calendar, I want to navigate to like two weeks from now on a Friday, whenever your now is, and we're going to schedule a meeting now. Now we could go up to the ribbon and click on new meeting, but I'm going to show you another way of doing it a way that I always do it. So 
on that Friday at the 10 a.m. appointment line, I'm going to double click and it brings up an untitled appointment. Now the only difference in outlook between an appointment and a meeting is a meeting you invite people to. So I can go up to the appointment tab on the untitled appointment ribbon and click on invite attendees. And now it's an untitled meeting. It's the only difference. And so the title of this meeting is going to be final review of proposal. And I'm going to make required to attend. I'm going to use my other email address there. So you can have multiple required people and you can have multiple optional attendees. I'm going to set the meeting to be from 10 to 11 and the location I'm going to just put in conference room A. Now you might have a list of locations for your organization, or you can just type them in. Now in the body of the meeting, I could go up to the insert menu and I could attach files or outlook items, just like you do with emails. It even has the ability of accessing your auto text entries from there. On the meeting tab, you can get to your templates, view and manage templates, right? So you can have meeting style templates that you develop. So similar to what you can kind of do with, you know, regular emails in that regard, we're going to just click on send. So the meeting automatically shows up on our calendar. Now my inbox is still open. So I'm going to switch back over to my inbox and I'm going to access my other email accounts inbox. So the person that you're inviting to a meeting will get an email saying who it's from and what the subject of the meeting is. And when they click on it, it says, please respond. It shows like it would show on their calendar. Now, this is what happens. If they decline the meeting, it would not be on their calendar. They can accept the meeting. They can say they're tentatively accepting it and it would appear on their calendar. When they go to accept the meeting, they could send a response back to the meeting organizer or they could just say, send a response now, meaning they'll get an email saying that you accept it, but no other text. So I'm going to do send the response now. And that email disappeared from my inbox, the person who received the invitation. But if I switch back over to my calendar, I'll show you this. So this is my calendar. I'll do it this way. This is the calendar from where I sent the invitation. And this is the calendar for my other account and they're overlaid so I can separate them. You can see them side by side. So now because the person accepted it's on their calendar and it's always on the organizer's calendar. So that's kind of how that works. We'll deal with multiple calendars later in the course. So we've worked with appointments and meetings, and now we're going to work with events. An event is an all day thing. So let's navigate to September 15th. And you can just double click anywhere on the calendar on any timeline. And the difference between an appointment and an event is this checkbox right here that says all day. So when you check that, now it says untitled event. We're going to call it staff appreciation day. Our mythical company is having a full day of activities for the staff that they appreciate so much. 
and we're going to put in land park and it's an all day event. We're not going to make it recurring or anything. We're not going to insert anything in it. We're going to just save and close. So notice it shows up at the top of your calendar. An all day event does not show up on any particular time frame. It's at the top of your calendar. And our final topic in this lesson is how to print your calendar. So a couple of ways you can do it. I usually use the shortcut key, but if you have the print icon up here on your quick access toolbar, you can print that way. You could go to the file tab and choose print, or you can do control and the letter P, which is the shortcut key for print preview and print in all the office applications. So a couple of things I like to say on the left side, you have different styles. This is the weekly agenda style that shows up by default. You can click on daily style to see what that looks like. Weekly calendar style, monthly style, which is what I normally print when I print. You also have a trifold style. So if you wanted to fold it up and calendar details style, in which case you could tell it to start a new page each day or week or month. You can tell it to print any attached files. We're going to cancel out of that. Let's do monthly style. And let's say we want to print the calendar for just August and September. So it's on the calendar. It's on the month that I did staff appreciation day on. So we're going to go to print options underneath the name of your printer. And down at the bottom, we can do a print range. So I'm going to do the drop down next to start and I'm going to navigate and I'm going to just say August 1st, the drop down next to end, and I'm going to select September 30th. And then on the bottom, I can click on preview. And now you're seeing August and your next page navigation down at the bottom of your screen. You can see September and then you would just simply click on your print button going to go ahead and I'm going to do the back arrow. I'm not going to print that out, but you saw all the different views that you can print in and how you can change the range. And the final lesson in this introductory outlook course is working with task and notes. After this lesson, we'll go into the advanced outlook modules. So we have two topics here, creating tasks, and that's going to be from an email and creating notes. So let's go ahead and close our calendar and our inbox should still be open. I meant to say I was going to maximize my inbox. Let's do another new email to yourself and it'll just be, please do as the subject, please take care of colon Josie's package Nate's proposal and send it. So we get the email and that's like giving us a to-do list. It's giving us tasks to do. And I don't want to forget it. I don't want it to just be in my inbox, get lost in the shuffle. So I want to create a task from that email and the way to do it is click and hold on the email, click and hold on it, and you're going to drag it down on top of your clipboard with the check mark, which is your task list, drag it down there and drop it. So it gives you a new task with the subject line, please do right. It doesn't give me a start date, but I'm going to say, okay, I know she wants this done by the following Monday. So I'm going to do the start date and the end date are going to be the same, right? And I'm going to just choose save and close. 
And now we're gonna go down and open our task list at the bottom of our folders pane. And there's a couple of things I want you to see. Under my tasks, it's gonna have a to-do list and then it's gonna have any tasks for any mailboxes that you have in here. And so the to-do list, when we were marking messages, I said, you'll see another way that they show up and they show up any messages you mark show up in the to-do list and they're categorized by today or so there's the message templates message next week right please do attaching an outlook item and my time has changed again i'm after midnight again so that's where your items show up when you mark them or when you make them a task by dragging them down to your task icon like we did with the please do email now your task list i'm going to go to my task list for training right so that task that we added shows up on the to-do list because we dragged it. Now, when I go to the task list, if I do control and the letter N, it brings up an untitled task. Now with a task, you can assign the task to someone else. If you have permissions to do so, you can make it recurring. You can categorize, flag it all of those things, make it of high importance. Now we didn't do these on emails, but you can make an email high importance. It will show up with an exclamation point in the inbox or low importance. And so for the subject line for this task is going to be make sure printer has proposal by Tuesday. And I'm gonna assign it a start date on the following Tuesday. Now I can come back in and track when I started. I can say that it's in progress, completed, waiting on someone else or deferred, right? Most people don't come in and track. Um, the priority is normal, it could be low or high as well. Some people come in and track along the way percent complete. Some companies require that kind of tracking. It just depends on what you need to know. You can set a reminder for the task, right? If I check that box, it'll tell me when it will remind me and it will remind me at 8 a.m. if I want it to. I'm gonna say remind me at 10. And I am the owner of this task. So right up here, it lets me know that the task is due in five days. I'm gonna go ahead and save and close it. So now it shows on my actual task list. Give yourself another task. I'm gonna set up another task and I'm gonna assign it to another email address. So I'm gonna do control N again and I'm gonna say assigning this to Trish. And then I'm gonna go up and click assign task. So it gives me a two box, right? And I'm gonna populate that with my other email address. And I'm gonna give it a start date of the nearest Friday. And now at the bottom, I can keep an updated copy of this task on my task list. And I can also get a, sat, a status report when the task is complete. I'm gonna leave both of those checked. And I'm gonna say, create cover for proposal. And I'm gonna send it. So since I left it checked to keep a updated copy of this on my task list, it shows up on my task list as well. If Trish goes and does work on it and updates the status or the percent complete or something like that, it will update on my task list as well. You can also see on the left that I have a new entry on my Trish email address for tasks. And when I go there, I see the tasks. So as Trish, I can open it, right? It's telling me it's not started and all of that. I get to accept or decline it. I'm going to accept it. 
So it now belongs to Trish. I think she might have. Yeah. I'm going to mark it complete as well. It seems like I'm out of sync. So Trish did it. I go back here and it's also marked complete. Yeah, that kind of got out of sync a little bit, but you get the general idea there. So that's how you can work with your task list. And remember your, your flagged items will show up on the to-do list. So now we move on to creating notes. The notes feature in Outlook is just like using sticky notes. So down at the bottom of my folder pane, I'm going to go to what looks like a sticky note and click on it. And it brings me to the notes window. I'm going to click on notes for my training account. And you notice you have icon here. You have the icon in the views notes list. We'll look at views when we get a couple of notes in. We're going to go ahead and click on new note, right? And it opens up a note window. So in that window, it's just like a big sticky note. Remember to turn off monitors, something like that. And then I can just close it in the upper right hand corner. Now, the other thing I can do with a sticky note, and I just arranged my screen, I can actually drag it and drop it onto my desktop. So if I want it more visible to me, I can do it that way. Now, if I were to close Outlook, the sticky note will disappear off of my desktop. Maximize this again. So you can also look at this, the new items. You can do a new email message from in here. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's all kind of connected. Let's do another new note. And you can type whatever you want. And you can just close it. You can right click on any note. You can copy it. You can print it. You can forward it. You can categorize notes, right? and you can delete them. So there's something else I wanted to show you in here. Now that we use tasks and now that we use notes, let's go back to our inbox. And we're gonna go back to the view tab. And on the view tab, in the layout group, so we've already talked about the folder pane, right? On the left and you can minimize it from here or turn it off from here. We talked about the reading pane. We have not talked about the to-do bar. So click on the to-do bar in the layout group and click on calendar. Click it again, click on people, click it again and click on tasks. So you can have this other panel on the right side of your screen known as the to-do bar. It gives you a mini calendar of the current month. It shows you upcoming appointments that are on your calendar. If you make any of your contacts favorites, right? So you can right click a person anywhere in office to add them to your favorites. So you can make a contact a favorite. Your favorite contacts will show here. And we'll revisit that later in the course. And then you have your to-do list. Basically, your flagged items, right, are showing up at the bottom. So that's because when we went to the to-do bar, we selected all three things, calendar, people, and tasks. By way of review, we've covered two modules in this introductory portion of the Outlook video course. Module one was the basics of Outlook. And in module two, we covered managing Outlook. In module one, we focused on you becoming comfortable in the Outlook environment by learning how to navigate in it. You learned about how you can format your messages, 
also how to add attachments and track messages. Specifically, the learning outcomes here were, when we finish this module, you should be more efficient when managing your mailbox. You can modify some settings within Outlook. You can attach files in an email and other Outlook items, and you're able to track recall and resend messages. When we got to the second module, we focused on managing Outlook, and you were introduced to the tools that help you organize your messages, manage your contacts, and schedule meetings, appointments, and appointments on your calendar. So the learning outcomes for this module were that at the end of it, you'd be able to create folders, categories, and mark messages. You can add and edit contacts. You have the ability to schedule appointments, events, or meetings, and you're able to save notes and create tasks associated with an email and also create tasks from the task list. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Microsoft Outlook 2021 video course. Outlook is the email calendaring application used worldwide. This course is for anyone looking to learn about all the really cool features Outlook has to offer from beginning to end. In this module, you'll learn how to group, sort, filter, and search for messages, how to modify Outlook settings, create automated replies, and create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. In the final module, you'll learn how to work with multiple calendars, import and export contacts, share and delegate access to other users, create and assign tasks, and last but not least, how to back up your Outlook items. Now it's time for us to move on to the advanced portion of Outlook 2021. And this also consists of two modules. Module three is automating Outlook and module four is advanced Outlook settings. Let's take a deeper look at module three. This module will cover more advanced settings within Outlook. We'll also talk about the search functionality and automating repetitive tasks. We have a few learning outcomes for this module. At the end of it, you should be able to group, sort, filter, and search for messages. You should also be able to modify settings within Outlook, create automated replies, and create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. And we'll get there by covering these lessons. In the first lesson, you'll learn about modifying messages and setting global options. Lesson two is organizing, searching, and managing messages. Lesson three is more on managing your mailbox. And lesson four is automating message management. In the first lesson, you'll learn how to insert advanced characters and objects, how to modify message settings and options, how to configure global Outlook options, and also how to customize the Outlook interface. Let's go ahead and bring up a new email message. And we'll use this email to learn about how to insert advanced characters and objects. So you can address it to yourself or to another email address if you like. I'm gonna address it to myself and another email address. And we're gonna use poll as in P-O-L-L, poll, as a subject line. And actually we'll do poll dash advanced characters. You wanna be in the body of the email. So the first thing we're gonna type is, this is a poll powered by Microsoft Forms. And then you're going to put your insertion point right after Microsoft before the space. You're going to go to the insert tab of the ribbon and over to the right, you have a symbols group. We're going to do the drop down arrow for symbol. And we're going to just go to more symbols. 
Now, I'll tell you that at the top, you have a symbols tab, which you're on. You also have a special characters tab. And you will see in a moment how some of the symbols are also considered special characters. So I want us all to use the same symbol. If you look over here, I'm in a subset called Latin-1 Supplement. I'd like you to do that drop down and select the same subset that I'm in. In that subset, you'll see that I already have it selected, the registered trademark symbol. Once you find it and select it in the lower right corner, you're gonna click on insert. And you can see it in the body of the email, it inserted it already. Now go to the special characters tab and you'll see some other special characters, but you'll also see that registered trademark symbol. This tab will give you the shortcut key that you can use whenever you need to insert that symbol, Alt-Control-R. We're gonna go ahead and close the symbol dialog box. Click at the end of the word form and press enter. Also in that symbols group, and this comes in handy sometimes, you have the horizontal line. Go ahead and click it, and then click it again. So you inserted two horizontal lines underneath that, just to kind of make a difference between the upper half and the lower half, something like that. Now also on the Insert tab, in the Include group, the third icon is Poll. And if you hover over it, it says Create an Instant Real-Time Poll you're gonna click it. And it opens up the polls pane on the right side of your email message. On the polls pane, you'll notice in the upper right hand corner, even though we haven't done anything in the poll, it has a counter of characters, 83-330. So 330 total characters, but 83 of them are already reserved for overhead without us even typing anything. We're gonna click where it says input your question and we're gonna type, did you enjoy the Outlook introductory video course? Question mark. Click where it says option one and that's gonna be yes. Option two is no. And we're gonna add an option and this is gonna be no opinion. Now notice as you hover over your options, you can delete them if necessary. We're gonna scroll down and we'll see that you can allow for multiple answers. We're not gonna do this with our poll. We're gonna click next at the bottom. So this is what the respondent would see. Your email address will be sent with your response. Did you enjoy it? It shows the question and answer, vote, view results. We're gonna click add to email here. And so you'll see it and notice, it lets you know that the poll card has been added and it tells you don't worry about seeing just a link in the email. Recipients will be able to vote directly in email or on the web. Now I'm gonna go ahead and close that polls panel by using the X in the upper right hand corner. And it got rid of, this is a poll powered by my, well, no, it, there it is. This is a poll powered by Microsoft Forms. So I still see it, it's there. I'm gonna select that text and cut it by using Control X. And then I'm gonna press home to get to the beginning of that line press enter, up arrow, and then control V to paste that line. So I wasn't in the right space when I said that, when we put in the poll. But it doesn't really matter. I can select the poll as well and put that underneath. I'm gonna cut it, control X, and click underneath the horizontal lines. So that's kind of how we had it originally. I just didn't have us in the right place when we inserted the poll. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and click send. So I've gone to my other email and you can see I have the email poll advanced characters and I already selected it so I can see it in my reading pane. 
Did I enjoy the Outlook introductory video course? For this one, I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And then I'm going to click on the vote button. So it automatically shows results, right? Yes, I got one vote. And then I'm going to go to my other email. And this one, I'm going to say no opinion and vote. And so now you see it's here. So if I keep this email open, I sent it right. And I can keep refreshing it here as other people. If I sent it to a bunch of people as they respond, I can always look at it and refresh and see the results. Now, the one other thing I'll say about the form and Outlook, the poll form, is that anybody who takes the poll can also view the results. So if you click on view results, you'll see the results that have been submitted so far. You're not seeing who submitted the results, but you will be able to, all the respondents will be able to see the results of the poll. Okay, our next topic is going to be modifying message settings and options. Let's go ahead and bring up a new email. And I've actually gone to the following week here. So you're seeing my inbox is collapsed, but it's saying last week. So we're going to just do a new email message. And I'm going to address it to my other email address. And if you have another email address, do so as well. Or you can address it to yourself. The subject for this one is going to be message settings and options. I'm going to type a quick sentence here. We are going to learn about settings and options at the message level. In the next topic, we will learn about global outlook options. So now what we want to do is let's go to the options tab on the new message window. And on the options tab, just to show you, if you wanted to do a blind carbon copy, uh, BCC is you send an email to me and you BCC your boss. I do not know that you also copied your boss on that email. So if you want to do a BCC, the field doesn't show up automatically. You have to click BCC and show fields, and then you get a BCC line. And if you click on BCC again on the ribbon, the BCC line will disappear. Now there's a tracking group and we used this earlier when we requested a delivery and a read receipt. There's also something in there called voting, use voting buttons, but there's even more in that tracking group. To open the entire group, you're going to click on that little diagonal arrow in the lower right hand corner of the group. Here, I'll point to it for you. And if you click on that, it will open all of the options, those options that are on the ribbon, as well as some other ones in this property dialog box. So if you, and some of these things you can do from the ribbon and different tabs on the ribbon, but they're all kind of put together in this dialog box. So let's say we wanted to mark this message important. By default, the importance is normal. Your choices are low, normal, and high. Choose high on this one. So on this message, you're marking it with high importance and use that sparingly. Don't mark every message that you send with high importance. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf after a while. And then you have a sensitivity setting, which is also defaulting to normal. And we're going to say, let's mark this one confidential. And you'll see how this shows up when your recipient gets the email. Now, 
We have polls now available, and you just saw that in the last topic, but there's also voting buttons that you can use in Outlook. So let's check use voting buttons, and you notice that it gives you three defaults, approve, reject, yes, no, yes, no, maybe. You can also just type over those and make your own options. We'll leave this one on approve, reject. And this again is to show you how these things show up in the actual email. We already learned about the delivery and read receipts, so we'll skip those. Now under delivery options, let's say that you're sending this email and you're leaving tomorrow for a vacation. You can have the replies to this email sent to someone else in your organization, your department, a colleague, maybe your manager. So you can set that up in here as well. We're not going to do that. Now let's say that you're going on vacation tomorrow and you're sending this email today, but you don't want it delivered until Tuesday. So you can say, do not deliver before and pick a date and a time. Now you can also expire or email an email after a certain date and time. Why would you want to expire an email? Say you're sending out a group email and you're trying to decide where to have the annual staff get together. Well, once you receive your responses, maybe you'll use a poll for that, right? Give them some choices. Once you get all of your responses, and as the date of the event is occurring, you no longer want those emails to be still sitting out there. So if you, an exp if you expire an email in the recipient's inbox on the date and time that you set for it to be expired, it will be crossed out with a red line in their inbox. It doesn't remove it from their inbox. They can still reply to it, but... The training here is that if you get an email in your inbox and it's crossed out and dimmed out, just ignore it. It has expired. And it's automatically saving copies of sent messages. You can also categorize your messages if you'd like, this message in particular, rather. We're going to go ahead and close. So if you look at the top above your send, it says you added voting buttons to this message. I have another thing that pops up because I'm actually recording this on a weekend. So it's asking me if I want to send it during work hours. So it just lets you know that you added voting buttons to the message up here. Go ahead and click on send. So now I've switched to my other email so you can see how this message appears in my inbox. Because we marked it with high importance, it has the red exclamation point on the right side of the message header. So that happens automatically. Now, if we had done low importance, I think it's like a blue arrow or something. So we have that exclamation point, meaning this is important. It should get your attention. When I click on the message and I look at it in the reading pane, it says this message includes voting buttons. Click here to vote. It also says, please treat this as confidential because we also marked it as confidential. It also lets you know that this message was sent with high importance, which is indicated by the red exclamation point in the inbox. So if I want to vote, I can click here to vote right in that band. And it gives me my two choices, approve or reject. I'm going to just be ornery and I'm going to reject this. And it says you have chosen to respond, reject, send the response now. Now, if I edit the response before sending, I can send a little note with it, but I'm going to just click OK and send the response now. It lets me know the date and time that I responded. So the email that I sent that message from 
will get the response in the inbox as you're seeing here. So Trish Connor Cato rejected message settings and options, which was the subject line, right? So I can see that response in my inbox. Now, the thing is, let's say I sent that vo voting buttons message to 25 people and they're responding on different dates and times. I don't want to have to keep looking through my inbox for the responses. So what you would do is you would go to your sent items folder, the email address that you sent the voting buttons email from. And in your sent items, you're going to open that email. So I'm going to double click on it. And when I open it, if I go to the message tab on the ribbon in the show group, I can click on tracking. And when I track it, it will have just a list of all the people who responded, what their response was, the date and time that they responded. At the top, it will have a summary. The time the message was sent, the total amount of replies, and what the total amount of responses. So I don't have to look through my emails, my inbox to see all the individual responses. I can go to the sent item, turn on tracking on the message tab of the ribbon and get my cumulative responses that way. I'm gonna go ahead and close this message and go back to my inbox. So now we're gonna move on to configuring global outlook options. And to do that, we're going to go to the file tab on the ribbon and all the way at the, almost at the bottom of the blue band on the left, you're going to click on options and you get the outlook options dialog box. Notice the different categories on the left. When you go in, you're on the general tab. So some of these, it's like your username, your initials, if you want to give it a background, an office background or an office theme, the themes carry over to all of your office programs. So if you choose a dark gray theme here, it will be dark gray and Excel, Word, etc. You have some startup options. Well, there's no startup options here, but you have attachment options. If you're attaching files from OneDrive or SharePoint, it's by default going to ask you how you want to attach them every time, or you could always share them as links or always attach them as copies. On the left side, if you click on mail, we'll go over some mail options. So this option right here, always check spelling before sending is why when you click on send, it will automatically perform spell check. And it also will ignore the original message text in a reply or a forward. So when you reply or forward to a message, and you'll see this play out, if there's a typo in the original message, it will ignore that when it's doing spell check. That's what that second check mark does. Let's go ahead and click on the signatures button on the right side under create or modify signatures for messages. So this is where you can set up your email signature that will automatically show at the bottom of every email that you send. So because I have multiple accounts in here, I'm making sure that I'm on the correct email account over here. And then I am going to click on the new button and type a name for my signature, and I'm gonna just call it default. You can have multiple signatures for multiple email addresses. So down here in the edit signature portion of the screen, I'm gonna just type my name, and I will put my email address there. Normally you would have your job title, maybe your phone number, that kind of thing. So I'm going to just keep it simple here. There's also templates that are available to you if you want to get signature templates, but I'm going to just leave this signature very simple. I can select all the text and change the font, the font size, do all of that kind of stuff with it. 
what I'm going to do is save it. And then notice under my email account on the right side, it says new messages are going to use the default signature. Now, I don't necessarily want a signature on my replies or forwards. So I will leave that set to none. And at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. So we'll see this when we get back into our email. I do want to go over some more global options for you. Right underneath your signatures, you could make your messages look more stylized by using stationary, if you will, on them. So click on stationary and fonts. And when you get in here, you're on the personal stationary tab. This is another way you can get back to your email signature. They're both share a tab here. So in the personal stationary tab, I'm going to click on theme and it opens up stationaries and themes. So a theme will show you a sample. I clicked on the theme afternoon. It will show you a heading style. If you have bullets in your email, the way they are configured, there would be a horizontal line and then heading style two, so on and so forth. Stationary actually is like the background of your email. So these are mixed in themes and stationaries. Stationaries have stationary after it in parentheses. So you can look at some of the stationaries. These get a little bit of play. I personally don't use these in my business emails. It's just a personal choice. I'll leave it like that. So you can go through and find a stationary that you can live with for the next few moments. I'm going to just use the tech tool stationary and click OK. And then, and this is where you can change your fonts for your new mail messages, replying or forwarding messages, so on and so forth. We're going to just click OK at the bottom. And then we saw this earlier from the view tab, right? But if you click on reading pane here, we talked about this. If you don't want the item to be marked as red when the selection changes, you can uncheck that box. I'm actually used to it, so I'm going to leave mine checked. You can also say mark items as read when viewed in the reading pane. You can wait however many seconds before marking the item as read. So I'm going to just leave mine on mark item as read when selection changes. And I'm going to click OK. You can go down and see that you can have it play a sound or change your mouse pointer or show an envelope in the taskbar or display a desktop alert when a new message arrives. And you have some information in here. I'm not going to go over all of these options with you, but I would suggest you go to file options and get familiar with them because this is how you can customize Outlook for yourself. So if you're replying and forwarding to a message, maybe you want your replies and forwards in a new window, stuff like that. It automatically saves items that have not been sent after, in my case, three minutes. You can change that time frame. So if I'm in the middle of typing an email and I don't finish it and I get distracted and start doing other stuff, it will automatically save it after three minutes to my drafts folder. Now, some of these we saw on message options, right? The default importance level is normal as opposed to high or low. Sensitivity level is normal as opposed to personal, private, or confidential. This is where you can change those settings globally. You can mark your messages as expired after this many days. We talked about expiring a message, right? So a lot of these you can do on a message basis or you can do it globally. I'm going to just show you a couple of calendar options. So on the left, go to calendar. If your work hours are different than eight to five, Monday through Friday, you can change them here. It will reflect on your calendar. If you want to change your default duration for new appointments and meetings, you can change it here. And you can add holidays to your calendar. If you click on add holidays, it automatically defaults to United States. And you only want to do this one time. If you 
add your United States holidays to your calendar, and then you come back in here and do it again, each holiday will be on your calendar twice. So we're going to click OK on that, and we'll check all of this out in just a bit. So the holidays were added to your calendar. You're going to click OK. And you can change your calendar color and all of that stuff. Now, when we were in the calendar earlier, I showed you that I had two different time zones. So if you under time zones, if you check the box that says show a second time zone, that's how that happens. So I like to have the East Coast and California on my calendar. And what you don't want to do, this is a little tricky wicket. If you swap time zones, it's going to change the time on your computer to whatever your second time zone is. I learned that the hard way years ago. So just want to get you comfortable with coming to Outlook options, checking them out, changing what you want. There's options for tasks over here where you can get a default reminder time. There are advanced options. And some of this you can do from the view tab. So customizing your Outlook panes, show you more ways to customize some stuff. At the bottom, we're going to just click OK to get out of there. So let's bring up a new email. And you'll see whatever stationery you chose. And I think mine looks horrible. I'm going to go back to File Options and get rid of it. Um, but the stationery shows as well as your signature. Now, let's say you had multiple signatures for your email address. Right on the message tab, you can get to your signature. You can see it is showing the default one, or you could go into signatures from there, right? And if you had another one, it would be in this list and you could select it to show in this email. Now, since I'm in here, I'm actually going to go to the personal stationery tab and I'm going to go to theme and I'm going to scroll all the way to the top and I'm going to choose no theme and click OK and OK. Now, it's not going to change it in this message, right? So it got rid of the stationery, but since I had this message already open, it's not going to delete it. I'm going to go ahead and close this message and bring up another new email. And now you can see going forward, I won't have the stationery, but I already have my email signature. So I want to do something with this email that will circle back around to in a little while in our next topic. So I'm going to address this email to my other self. And I'm going to give it a subject of conversation. And I'm going to click in the body of the message and it puts the insertion point above my signature. And I'm going to just type, this is the start of an email conversation. And I'm going to go ahead and send this email. Now, before we move to the next topic, at the bottom of your folders pane, go ahead and click on your calendar icon. I want to just point out a couple of calendar options from file options in here. So I'm on work week view and on the mini calendar for September on the left, I'm going to click on the fifth. And because we added the holidays, you'll see Labor Day United States on Monday the 5th, and it's on the calendar as an event above any of the appointment lines. The other thing I want to point out, if you just keep your eye on my California time zone, right, you'll notice that the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. are unshaded on the calendar. Those are the working hours that I have in file options for the calendar. So those are unshaded. Everything outside of that time frame is shaded on the calendar. And we can go back to the inbox. So I'm in the email that I sent the conversation email to. 
And I'm just going to select that email over here. By the way, it's very rare that I double click an email to open it. I normally just handle it in the reading pane to my right. Because in there I can do everything or from the ribbon. I can reply. If the email was to multiple people, I could reply to all of them. I could forward the email to someone. I could schedule a meeting based off of the email, so on and so forth. There's more actions. I can forward the email as an attachment as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reply and I'm going to just type sounds good and send it. And now I'll tell you why we're doing this. So part of this topic is customizing the Outlook interface. And we did some customizations earlier from the view tab, but I'm going to show you some more. So now I'm going to go back to my other inbox, the one that I sent it from. And here's my reply. Sounds good, right? And I'm going to reply to this. And I'm going to just say, fantastic. Thank you. Now I'm having a conversation back and forth via email with this person. And I'm going to go ahead and send. I don't want to have to look through my inbox to find the whole conversation, right? So there's a setting that we're going to change and you'll see how this works. I'm going to go up to the view tab and on the view tab in the messages group, I'm going to click on show as conversations. And it gives me the option to show messages arranged by conversations in this folder, meaning this inbox or in all my mailboxes. I'm going to choose this folder. And when I click on that conversation email, you'll notice it has an expand arrow in front of the person's name, my other, well, my name. I'm going to click that arrow and now you're seeing the entire conversation as if it's all in one thing. So I don't have to go to the individual emails. I can see everything right there in the conversation back and forth. It's just a nice feature. Now also on the view tab in that messages group, you have conversation settings, right? Um, where you can show messages from other folders or above the subject. I'm going to uncheck show messages from other folders because it was showing my sent items as well. And I can always expand the selected conversation so I don't have to use that expand arrow if I want that to be a setting. So that's kind of how that works. Okay. The second button on the view tab is view settings, right? And if you want to, so let me cancel out of here for a minute and just expand my today. And so I just have who it's from. I have the subject line. I have the date, so on and so forth, right? Um, I'm actually going to get rid of my show as conversations for right now. Go back to my inbox. Okay. So I may want to change what's showing and how it's showing. So that's where you use view settings, right? And I can say what columns I want to see in my inbox. So if I click on columns, right, it shows the columns that are currently showing in my inbox. And on the left side, there are other columns that could be used. If you wanted a CC column over there, for example, you can click on it and then add. That's kind of how that works. I'm going to cancel out of there. We went into group by earlier. And that's where I showed you how I can expand or collapse all of my groups in the inbox. And mine are all collapsed. We did that on the bottom right. And I'm going to cancel out of there. So by default, it's sorted. Your email is sorted by the receive date in descending order. So the most recent email at the top. You could change the sort order and you're going to learn how to sort messages and filter them in just in the next lesson. But this is where you go for all of this, right? 
we're going to go ahead and cancel out of there. Oh, by the way, and you don't have to go back into view settings, I will. If you play around in here and you get your settings so that you're just like, oh my goodness, I want to undo everything, you can always at the bottom reset your current view. I think that's important to know. You can reset your view from up here on the ribbon as well. Now, the first button on the ribbon is change view, right? So by default, it's in a view called compact. You have a single view, right? And you see the little bit of a difference there. And you also have preview view. And preview view gets rid of the reading pane. So those are three built-in views. I'm going to just take mine back to compact. So as mentioned, we're going to use some more of those view settings in our next lesson. So our second lesson here is organizing, searching, and managing messages. So some of this we're going to be doing from those view settings like grouping and sorting messages. You're also gonna learn how to filter and manage messages and how to search your Outlook items in this lesson. So now I'm gonna expand my last week folder because I have more in there. I'm gonna expand my last week folder in my inbox and back on the view tab, I'm gonna go to view settings again. And this time we're gonna to go to group by, not just so we can expand or collapse our inbox groups, but so we can actually group items. So uncheck at the top, automatically group according to arrangement. And where it says group items by none, we're gonna do the drop down, and we're gonna scroll down until we see from and click on from. And then by, we're going to do the drop down next to none. And we're going to choose received. And we're going to leave the from in ascending order and received in descending order. And we're going to click OK. And then OK again. So now you'll see all of my emails are grouped by from and then by date, right? Who it's from and then the dates of the emails. Now, some people like that arrangement. It's not my choice, but just so you know that you can group. We group by from and then the received date. And I'm going to right click on the top one and collapse all groups. And then I'm going to click on that reset view button and choose yes. And now it's back to the way it was before. So that comes in handy. I didn't have to go back into view settings. I'm just going to collapse all of my groups again. Let's go back to view settings. And notice now group by says none since we reset the view. Let's go to the sort button in view settings. So by default, it's sorting the items by the received date in descending order. Well, where it says received due to drop down, and scroll through and choose from, and then click OK, and OK again. So similar to when we grouped, except that you're actually just seeing the from, and it's not showing the dates underneath, right? So I'm gonna go back to collapse all groups. I'm gonna go to view settings this time and go back to sort. Now I could have reset the view and I'm gonna change the from back to received and then it automatically goes to descending and click okay and okay again. So when I reset my view, it got rid of my collapsed groupings in my inbox. So I've been manually collapsing them again. 
I'm going to go back to view settings, group by, and in the bottom right corner, I'm going to choose all collapsed again and okay and okay. So now we're going to go back to view settings because that's also where you go. And if you notice the filter is set to off by default, there is no filtering set on your inbox. So we're going to click on the filter button and you can search for the words, right? On the message tab there, search for the words in the subject field only or search who it's from, who it was sent to, or where you are the only person in the two line. If I, if I check where I am and then do the drop down, or on the two line with other people or on the CC line with other people, those are your choices. And then you have a time box there, right? When it was received, if I choose receive down there, and I'll say in the last seven days. And then I put in my from my other self, right? So this is filtering messages from this email or this person received in the last seven days. And I'm going to click OK and then OK. So now it's showing any from today sent from that person and the last seven days sent from that person. So I do have a filter applied. Now I want to show you where you can tell whether or not you have a filter applied in your mailbox. If you look all the way down at your status bar, the gray band all the way at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that it says filter applied. And that's because if I right click in my status bar, notice I have the check mark in front of filter. So I have that turned on so it will show up there when I have a filter applied. Good visual cue. I'm going to go back to view settings and I'm going to go to filter and I'm going to choose clear all in the bottom right corner and click OK. And I'm going to click OK again, and the filter is off. Now, in terms of searching your email, you don't use view settings for that. You can use the search box at the upper right hand corner, right? So you can search for more than just emails in here, by the way, right? It actually gives you actions like how to turn off your reading pane, change your profile, how many lines do you want in your message preview kind of thing. So in the search box, I'm going to type message settings and press enter. And notice my results, right? Come back today. So it's showing anything that has message settings in the subject line, in the body of the message, it's looking at those as two separate words, right? And it highlights them in yellow, anywhere where it's seeing message and or settings. And it's showing all the emails and the selected two words are highlighted in yellow. Pretty cool. Now, when you do a search, you also get a search tab on the ribbon and it's searching the current mailbox by default. If you want to clear the search up at the search box all the way to its right, you're going to click the X and it gets rid of the search. Let's click in the search box again. And once you click in that search box, the search tab shows up on the ribbon on the search tab. In the refine group, you're going to click on has attachments. So now my results are showing emails with attachments attached, right? Pretty cool. 
Now, I can use the refine group. I could say it's from a certain person with a certain subject, has attachments. I can search for messages that are categorized, right? I just clicked on has attachments to get out of there. Let me go back to the search tab of the ribbon. One second. And click back on that. So has attachments. Yeah. So you'll notice up in the search, the phrase says has attachments colon yes, because we clicked that button. So it's showing those in the results. Now, if I click the X that clears that search, I can go back into the search box, back to the search tab and click on categorize and click on illustrations. And we'll see the results where we categorized and we changed that blue category to illustrations in the introductory part of this course. Search is pretty cool. Now, just to go over some more things, so you can search by just typing what you're looking for in the search box. You can use the search tab on the ribbon you can search for flag mail, mail that's been marked important. There's more items expiring soon, and you can add some fields there. You can also find your recent searches here. So category equals illustration has attachments equal. Yes, right? I had some other stuff on that list as well. So the search functionality is really cool. Now, when you're searching, you're searching in the current mailbox. I'm going to show you another type of search, right? So in the search box, I'm going to type SharePoint. And then I'm going to choose in the scope on that search tab of the ribbon, I'm going to choose all outlook items. So it's showing me my results. Now, if you look at my, I'm just going to collapse all of these groups, right? I have results in my calendar. I have results in my inbox. These are different folders that I have. Learn it, Microsoft Netherlands. I have it in my sent folder and sent items, right? So it's showing me everywhere that it's finding SharePoint. So if I look at my calendar, I see my SharePoint consultations, right? Which show up on my calendar. So I'm going to do the X to the right of the search box and clear that search. So our next topic here, or actually our next lesson is how to use junk email. How does the whole thing work? Well, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for when something ends up in your junk email box, right? Sometimes I receive mails from certain people all the time and very occasionally one of their emails will end up in my junk email. You usually know it when someone says, hey, did you receive my email? And you're like, no. And they're like, hey, check your junk email. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to force this to happen here. I just have this other email that I get a daily briefing. You can really drag any email that's in your inbox. We're going to drag it. I'm going to drag this email onto my junk email folder. And I'm just going to say, okay, I want to continue. So you'll know you have items in your junk email when your junk email is bold and it has a number or numbers next to it, right? Indicating you have junk email. So let's say you get an email in your inbox and you want to make it junk. Now, I don't want to make this junk. It's kind of hard to force something to come up automatically that really would be junk right now during this video course. So I'm going to make believe this is junk. Now I'm going to right click on that email in my junk email and I'm going to hover over junk and it says block sender, never block the sender, never block the sender's domain, never block this group or mailing list. Then it says not junk. 
If it's not junk, you won't want to click that option. So let's do that option first. I'm going to say it's not junk and it will let me know that the message will be moved back into the inbox folder. So I click OK. And then it's just back in my inbox. And I'm going to go back to my inbox and find it again and drag it back to junk email so I can show you the other options. So back in my junk email folder, I'm going to right click on the message, hover over junk, and I'm going to go to the bottom and select junk email options. Okay. So I'm going to go, let's make believe in this example that this is junk email. I'm going to go to block senders and I'm going to choose add on the right, right? So this email comes from this email address, viva-noreply at microsoft.com. I could put that in, but I probably want everything from that particular domain to be considered junk. Now I'm just doing this as an example. I'm going to have to undo this. So instead of typing the email address, I'm going to type at microsoft.com. So I'm going to click OK on this. And so any emails that come into my mailbox from that domain will automatically be sent to my junk email. Now, I really don't want that to happen. But that's the way, because you notice when you get junk email, especially if it's scam mail and everything, it'd be Sam at whatever domain. And then you send that to junk. And two days later, you get one from Peggy at that same domain. So you could block the entire domain or the email. Now I'm going to just remove this. You also have a safe senders list. So it put this on my safe senders list. The other thing also trust email from my contacts. If I have people in my contacts list, I don't want them to go to my junk email. So you can go here and make sure that doesn't happen. And then you can also add, automatically add people I email to your safe senders list. So those people don't get blocked either. And we're going to go ahead and click OK at the bottom. So I'm going to move this email. I'm going to right click on it again, hover over junk and say not junk. So it sends it back to my inbox for me. But that's how you handle your junk email. And you, you might want to just kind of look at it like every day or so just to see, make sure you're not missing anything and you can adjust and put people on the safe recipients list and so on and so forth. And I'm going to go back to my inbox. So managing your junk email was our third lesson. I just didn't bring the slide up for it. Now we're going to do the fourth and final lesson in this module before moving into our next module. And this is automating message management. So we're going to learn how to use automatic replies how to use the rules wizard to organize messages and how to create and use quick steps. This is really all super cool features that I get excited about. So now we're going to set it up so that we will have automatic replies in response to emails coming into our inbox. To do so, we're going to go to the file tab of the ribbon to go backstage. And right there on the info tab, you'll see automatic replies. We're going to click the button. So these are not just used for when you're going to be out of the office. It could be away from your desk. You could be in a meeting for two hours. You could be going to vacation. You just want any incoming senders to get an automatic response, whatever the reason may be. So by default, automatic replies are not on. We're going to enable them by doing the option button in front of send automatic replies. And then once you enable it, you can tell it to only send during this time range. 
So we're going to make believe we're getting ready to take a two week vacation. So I'm going to start mine. I'm going to just change the start time to 10 30 PM just so I can demonstrate it during this course, the way it's going to work. And I'm going to say that I'm going to be returning to work on August 22nd in my case, and I'll make that 8 a.m. So on the bottom half, you have two tabs, inside and outside your organization. If someone, whether they're inside or outside of my organization, sends me an email during this time frame, they're going to get one automatic reply from my account. If they subsequently send me another email, they will not get another automatic reply. And it says that here, it will automatically re reply once for each sender with the following message. So on the bottom half of the screen, you're going to click underneath the type of font. And this is the inside my organization. I'm going to just type, I will be on vacation until 8.22, contact Jenny A if you need anything. And then I'm gonna switch to the outside my organization tab. Now, if I only wanna send an automatic reply to people inside my organization, I can disable it for people outside my organization by unchecking auto reply checkbox here. If I do want a message to go out for people sending from outside my organization, I can choose to have it only go to my people in my contact list or anyone outside my organization, which is the default. This one I'm going to make a little more formal. I'm going to type thanks for your email. I will be away from the office until August 22nd. If you need anything, please contact, and I'm just gonna put in Jenny Alvarado at Jenny, and I'm just gonna give her an email address. Or you can call her at Make believe phone number coming up. Something like that. And then I simply click OK. So now right here, it lets me know that auto replies are being sent from this account. I'm going to do the back arrow at the top of the blue band to get back to my mailbox. Right underneath my ribbon, it also lets me know that automatic replies are being sent for this account, and I could turn them off from there as well. So I'm going to go to my other email address, my other mailbox, and I'm going to send myself an email. So when I address the email from my other account, it lets me know that training has an automatic reply going and that training is not available. Now at this point, I can say both of my email accounts are both within my organization. So that would show up anybody that's using Outlook. But anyway, at this point I could decide, well, she's not around, I won't send the email or I will go ahead and send the email. So the subject for this one is going to be, we'll just call it automatic reply. And I'll just type, hey, Trish, let, let's get together when you are available. And then I'm going to go ahead and send it. So now you see I get the automatic reply. This is from my sending email and it gives the within my organization message that I wrote. 
And when I switch back to my training mailbox, I get the email that came in while I'm on vacation. Now I'm going to turn off automatic replies. And I'm going to do it right underneath the ribbon, the yellow band. So earlier in the introductory part of this course, we learned how to create subfolders underneath our inbox folder. That's when we created a manager folder and a training folder. And after we created those folders, we went in to our inbox and we manually selected and dragged some emails from our inbox to those folders. Well, you can automate that process in Outlook by using rules. So we're gonna end up creating two rules. I wanna show you two different ways of creating rules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that the emails that I sent myself, which would be from Trish Connor Cato from my other email, I'm gonna have those automatically go to the manager folder as soon as they come into my mailbox. Now, if you have an email selected, like I do now, from the person that you want to create the rule about, you can do it in the way that I'm gonna show you first. So with any email that you sent to yourself from another email, if you don't have another email and you've been sending to yourself, just select one of those. And we're gonna create a rule that will make sure that any emails from Trish Connor Cato, in my case, will go to the manager folder automatically and when we create this rule, it will take any emails that are currently in my inbox and move them to the manager folder also. So on the home tab of the ribbon, in the move group, you're gonna click on the rules dropdown. And when you have an email selected, you will have the first and second choices available to you on this list. So the first choice is the easiest. It says always move messages from Trish Connor Cato, in my case. When I click on that, it brings me a choose a folder screen. You can expand your inbox if necessary and click on the manager folder and then click okay. So, it took a moment, but you notice I don't have a today group in my inbox now because all of the emails from today have been, well, when I've been doing this portion of the recording have been from Trish Connor Cato. So now when I go to my manager folder, all of the emails from Trish Connor Cato are in there, all of the ones that were in my inbox and any subsequent ones will go in here automatically. Now, when we manually moved emails from the inbox to the folder earlier in the course, I dragged some other emails in other than from Trish Connor Cato, and that's fine. So now I'm gonna go back to my inbox. Now this time, I don't wanna have any emails selected. I'm gonna go back to the rules dropdown, and my only choice without having an email selected is manage rules and alerts. And so this is creating a rule from scratch. We're gonna click on manage rules and alerts. And so you have email rules tab at the top and a manage alerts tab. So we're focusing on the rules right now. So apply changes to this folder. In this folder, we already have one rule right? And that's the rule we created while we had the email selected. And if you notice that rule is checked and at the bottom, it gives a description, apply this rule after the message arrives from Trish Connor Cato, move it to the manager folder and stop processing more rules. That's what it's doing. And we're going to test both of these in a moment, the existing rule and the one that we're getting ready to create. So what I wanna do is I wanna click on the new rule button and now you get to 
start from a template or from a blank rule. Step one, select a template. So they have templates categorized, stay organized, stay up to date, start from a blank rule. The top choice under stay organized is move messages from someone to a folder. And that's the choice that we're going to use here. Step two is edit the rule description and it tells you to click an underlined value. Apply this rule after the message arrives from and that people or public group is a link. So you can go ahead and click that. So I can select my training one here, my training email. I just have a blocker covering some phone information and I'm going to just double click on training, click okay. So now it says at the bottom, apply this rule after the message arrives from training and then move it to the specified folder. I'm going to click on specified and I'm going to select my training folder under the inbox and click okay. Now down at the bottom, it has a next button. When you do it from scratch, you get to select conditions. So it's from people or a public group. It's from training, right? And we can have with specified words in the subject. So if the subject says meeting, maybe somewhere in the subject line, maybe move it to a meeting folder or something like that. So if I get an email from training and it's marked as important, that can be moved to a folder. So you see all of these choices you have here and there's a long list, but wait, there's more. Those are your conditions. I'm not selecting any other than the default one. And we're going to go next at the bottom. Now, what do you want to do with the message? So it's going to stop processing more rules move it to the specified folder. I can also assign it to a category, delete it, which moves it to my deleted items folder, permanently delete it. It will permanently delete it. I can make a copy of it and have that move to a folder. I can forward it. I can flag it, print it, play a sound, all kinds of things. And there is another next button at the bottom. You can have exceptions to your rules. So any message that I receive from training is going to get moved to the training folder, except if the subject contains the specific word of kangaroo, because I might have a kangaroo folder for that. So these are exceptions to the rule. You can do next at the bottom again. You can specify a name for this rule. I'm going to leave it called training. Now, when you do it this way, it turns on the rule, but it won't run it on messages already in the inbox unless you do this checkbox. So we're going to check that. I'm not going to create this rule on all of my accounts and I'm going to do finish at the bottom. Now on my rules and alert screen, I have both of my rules listed. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So send an email to whatever email address you use for the training folder, and it should go directly into that folder. You can also send an email from the email that you use for manager and have it go in there. And I'll have you do that on your own. And if you have access to your other email, you'll have a one next to your manager folder and a one next to your training folder. Because the emails are automatically being routed to those folders via the rule. Now there may be times that you want to disable rules. So I'm going to go back to rules. I want to disable my rules for the rest of this class. And I'm going to go to manage rules and alerts. 
And I'm simply going to uncheck the rules. And I'm going to click apply. And then OK. And now to test it, I'm going to just do another new email. I'm going to send it to myself from the same account. And I'm going to call it test rule disabled. This is a test. And I'm going to go ahead and send it. So this should, if the rule was enabled, it would go into my training folder. However, since I disabled the rule, it's going into my inbox. Another feature that lends itself to efficiency and automation are using Quick Steps in Outlook. Quick Steps reside on the home tab of the ribbon. There's a whole gallery of Quick Steps. And there are some preset ones that come automatically with Outlook and you can create your own. And sometimes when you create a rule, it will create an accompanying quick step. So in order to see the preset quick steps, we're going to go to the right of the quick step gallery and we're going to do the diagonal arrow to open up the manage quick steps dialog box. So these are the ones that come by default. Well, this one is the first one here on my list is one because I had created that rule to move everything from training to the training folder. They're, the default ones that come with Outlook are to manager and some of them you actually have to edit them before you can use them for the first time. So the to manager one says that it's going to perform a forward on an email. So if you're on an email in your inbox and you click on the to manager quick step, it will forward it. It doesn't have a shortcut key assigned to it, but it wants to forward the selected email to your manager. So you would have to edit that. So you could put in who to forward it to before you could use it. So you would have to put in your manager's email address. Once you do that and save it, you can then utilize it. If you have an email selected, it would be available to you up here and you could just click on it in order to get that message to forward. You have another one that comes out of the box. It creates a new email message to your team. Again, that one has to be um, configured a little bit so you can let it know who your team is. You can mark a message as done or as complete, right? And it can, so this one does three actions. It marks it complete, moves it to a folder and marks it as read. And then you have a reply and delete one. So it will reply to the sender and delete the original email. Now I mentioned that you can create your own quick steps. So let's go down to the new button. And at the very bottom of that list, we're going to choose custom. And it gives it a name of my quick step. So that name will change depending on the actions that you choose. So it says add actions below that will be performed when this quick step is clicked on. So I'm going to do the drop down next to choose an action. And I'm going to choose move to folder. And then you have to choose a folder and I'm going to choose my training folder. Underneath that, I'm going to add another action. And this one on the drop down, I'm going to change the status of the message. I'm going to mark it as red. I'm going to add another action and choose an action drop down. And I am going to flag the message and then I'm going to choose a flag for next week. Now you can assign a shortcut key. You have control shift one through nine if you want. I don't usually do that. I just reorganize and then click the ones that I use from the quick step gallery on the ribbon. And you can put in a tool tip, which is the text that will show if you hover over the item. So we will say moves 
email to training folder marks as read and flags for next week. And then I'm going to click finish. So this one I have, okay, this is the one that's at the top and I would want it to be at the top, but I'm going to go back over to the right and I'm going to edit it because I want the name of this to just be move to training and flag. That's what I want to name the quick step and I'm going to save it again. So it's in the top position. Now, if I wanted to do a quick reply and delete, I might use that one more than others. So I'm going to click on that on the left side, and then I'm going to use the up arrow to move it to the second position. And now I'm going to click OK. So now I'm going to send myself an email. And the subject is going to be quick steps. And I'm just going to type, we are going to use a quick step we created. And I'm going to send the email. Now I'm going to select that quick steps email. And I'm going to go up to my quick steps. I'm going to hover over my move to training and flag quick step that we just created. You can see the screen tip moves email to training folder marks as red and flags for next week. So I'm going to click on that. And now I'm going to move over to my training folder. My number didn't change because it marked the email as red, so it's not showing up as unread. And you can see the flag that's set on it, right, for next week. So pretty cool, real efficient feature to be able to use. So the quick step differs from a rule because again, when we set up the rule to move every message from training to the training folder, it automatically does that on all the emails that come in. The quick step gives you more control. Some emails that I receive from training, I want to move to the training folder, mark as read and flag the message. So quick steps are more message by message, whereas a rule can be more global. Now we're ready to begin our fourth and final module of this course, Advanced Outlook Settings. So this module will cover the tools that help organize your messages, manage your contacts, assign tasks, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. It will also show you how to share and delegate your mailbox to coworkers. We have several learning outcomes in this module. By the end of it, you should be able to work with multiple calendars. You'll be able to import and export contacts. You'll have the ability to share and delegate access to other users, be able to create and assign tasks. Now we assigned a task earlier by dragging an email down to the task icon at the bottom of the folders pane. You're gonna learn other ways to assign tasks and you'll be able to back up your Outlook items at the end of this module. During this module, we will use the Outlook data file, it's named Disney.pst, that you brought over from the video description earlier in the course. This module is broken down into five lessons. We'll begin by working with calendar settings, move on to managing contacts, then we'll get into managing activities by using tasks, sharing workspaces with others, and we'll end by managing Outlook data files. In lesson five, we're gonna set advanced calendar options, create and manage additional calendars, and manage meeting responses. Now, earlier in the course, when we went over global Outlook options, we went over some calendar options. 
I'd like to go back to file and on the almost at the bottom of the blue band, go to options. And on the left side, click on calendar again. Just a reminder, this is where you can set your work times. So, and we reviewed that the area that is not shaded, it indicates your work hours on your calendar. If you need to change that or your days of the week, the first day of your week or the first week of your year, you can change all of that here under work time. I'm going to change my default duration for new appointments and meetings to one hour instead of two hours. And I can also, let's see, we already added the holidays to our calendar and we'll revisit that in a moment. I'm going to go down under display options and I'm going to change my calendar color. I think I like this orangey kind of color. And I'm going to not show my second time zone. If you created one earlier, you can uncheck it now. And remember, you don't want to swap them because if you swap them, the first one that shows on the list will be the one that it sets your system time to. And all the way at the bottom, it's automatically checked. You can show the weather on the calendar and change how you want to show the temperature. So we're going to click OK there. And I can see my coloration, that orangey color on my calendar now. And again, my work hours are unshaded. Anything outside of that is outside of work hours. And I just have the one time zone here on the left. Now, in the upper right hand corner, you have your view. You can change the view of your calendar from the ribbon or the upper right hand corner. I like looking at it in work week view. You can choose what view you like the best. I'm going to leave mine on work week and to the left of that, it's showing me Washington DC here. I'm going to go down to add location and I'm going to just type in Sacramento CA and press enter to search for it. And now it's showing me the weather for today, tomorrow and the following day for that location. If I go back to Washington DC from the drop down, it's not showing me the weather and it should. You can add more locations here. Seems to only want to show it for Sacramento for me right now. Now on the left side, underneath your little mini calendars, you may or may not have all the sections that I have. I have several different calendars because I have several different email addresses tied into my Outlook account. So I have a calendar from my primary email address. I have a calendar from my training email address. And both of those email addresses have a birthdays calendar that it just gave me. When I initially downloaded my holidays, right, it gave them to my primary calendar. So United States holiday for my primary email account, almost like a separate calendar. And then I downloaded the holidays again when I was in this account. So it downloaded them again. Now at this point, it downloaded it as a shared calendar. If I go and try to download the holidays again, it'll give me a warning that they've already been downloaded. So yours may have come across as a shared calendar as well. So how did I see the holidays on my calendar earlier? Right now, I'm on my calendar for this training email account. And if I go to my holidays calendar, if I check that one, it puts them side by side. Now I can overlay them. If I look at the right side, there's a left pointing arrow on its left edge and it says view and overlay mode. So I view and overlay mode. And then when I go to September 5th, I will see Labor Day. So anything that's on that holidays calendar shows up as green. Everything that's on my regular training calendar shows up as blue. And to make them go side by side again, I can use what's now the right pointing arrow on my holidays calendar 
and they're side by side. And I choose to close my holidays calendar by using the X in its upper right hand corner. So you can view multiple calendars side by side. At some point, if you had like six or seven calendars, they'd just be skinny little panels and that doesn't look good. By using the overlay function is how you can do that. You can create other calendars in Outlook. Again, you get your holidays calendar, you get birthday calendars, you get calendars for every exchange email address that you have in your Outlook. And if you go to the home tab of the ribbon in the manage calendars group, you can click on open calendar. So you can open a calendar from the address book, from a room list. If somebody's maintaining a list of calendars for different like conference rooms, you can open a calendar from an address book as long as you have permissions to that calendar. You can open a calendar from the internet, again, permission-based. If someone shares their calendar with you, you can open a shared calendar from here. You also have a shared calendar group that will be created on the left side. And you also have the ability to create a new blank calendar. So I use my Outlook calendars heavily but I like to have a blank calendar that I can actually print out on a monthly basis just to keep on my pen board in my office so I can easily view it even when I'm not in Outlook. So I'm gonna show you how to create a new blank calendar by clicking on that. And notice it's gonna put it in your calendar folder underneath whatever email address you're in. And I'm gonna name it blank yeah, I'm gonna just name it blank. And I'm gonna click OK. So now if I expand my calendars on the left, I will see the blank calendar. I'm gonna select it, deselect my training calendar, and now I have a blank calendar. And I could do Control P on it, right? and I decide I want the monthly style. And then I would go into print options and I would say start it with, I'll go to August 1st through, and I'll end with August 31st. And then I can preview it there and you'll see I'll get a blank monthly calendar for the month of August. I'm going to do the back arrow at the top of the blue band to get back to my calendar. So now we're going to create another calendar based on our Outlook address book. So we're going to go back to our open calendar drop down on the ribbon. And this time we're going to choose from address book. So a couple of things here. I put some um, images, privacy blockers on my screen. And before I did that, I navigated to the contacts list for one of my email accounts. I already selected a contact from that list. I double clicked on the contact and just their name shows down here. Now this is gonna be an example of you can add a calendar from your address book or from your contacts, even if you don't have permissions to that calendar. And you'll see how that works. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK in the bottom. And then you'll see that it opens on the right-hand side of my screen and it says could not be updated because I don't have any permissions to that calendar. So I'm not gonna be able to see or get any updates when Teresa adds entries to her calendar. I can, however, attempt to add something to this calendar. So I'm gonna just double click on any appointment line and it lets me know that I don't have permissions. So that's what happens if you try to add a calendar that you don't have permissions to in your address book. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the X in the upper right hand corner of that calendar to close it. And notice it shows under my shared calendars group on the folder pane on the left. And I'm going to right click on that calendar, Teresa Connor Brown, and I'm going to delete it. It's useless for me to have it if I don't have permissions to it. So this time I went back to my open calendar from address book, put my privacy blockers back up, back in a contacts folder, and I already have a contact selected. And this contact is my other email. I already have permissions to this calendar. So you'll see the difference here. So I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So this one too opens on the right side. I can see the appointments and meetings that are scheduled on that person's calendar. And because of the permission levels that I have, I could even add things to that person's calendar. Now you'll learn more about permission levels in a later lesson. I'm going to just go ahead and close that untitled appointment window. I'm going to close that calendar on the right side. And I'm going to right click on it on the left hand pane and delete it. So now we're going to address how to manage meeting responses. To do so, I'm going to issue you a challenge. I want you to schedule a new meeting for 1 p.m. on the Wednesday next, whatever date you're on, the following Wednesday. And if you're able to, address it to your other email address. And for bonus, if you have two other email addresses that you can access, you're going to require both of those email addresses to attend the meeting. So I have my untitled meeting request open. I've addressed it to my two other email addresses and we're going to give it a title of schedule evaluation meetings. Going to just, I have mine set for a half an hour and that's fine from one to one thirty. and the location, I'm just going to type in conference room a. So you'll notice above your send button, it says you haven't sent this meeting invitation yet. Go ahead and click send. Once I click send, it puts the meeting on my calendar. So I switch back over to my mailbox and you'll notice that I have one unread message in the inbox of each of my other two email addresses. I'm going to go to the top one and expand today. And I see that I get the meeting invite and I'm just going to select it. And in the reading pane, I'm going to go ahead and choose the accept icon and then just send the response now, meaning I don't have anything to say. And at this point, it disappears from the inbox. I'm going to go to my second inbox, expand today, select the invite. And in the reading pane for this one, I'm going to reply tentative. And again, I'm going to just send the response now. Now I'm going to go to my training inbox. I have two unread emails in there and you can see that I get the responses, individual responses to my meeting request. Now, because all of these are accounts are in my name, they have the same name, but you can see that one accepted and one gave a tentative response. So now I'm back in my calendar. And this is the calendar, my training calendar. So I'm seeing the calendar from where I sent the invitation. And I'm going to warn you in advance, there is a little glitch in here. But I'm going to show you how to overcome it as well. So if I open that meeting invite that I sent, 
I'm going to just double click it to open it. Notice at the top, it gives me attendee responses. And this is where the glitch is. I have one accepted and one tentatively accepted, zero declined. So it should say one accepted, one tentatively accepted, and zero declined. But it's not updating in here right now. I'm going to close that. And I'm going to go back over to my inbox. Now, I've never really relied on the original meeting invite tally at the top. I prefer, because think of it this way, let's say you sent the meeting invite to 20 people and they're all responding at different times on different days. I don't want to have to look through my all my emails to find the meeting responses. So there are a couple of things you can do. The most efficient thing to do is to create rules. And you've already learned how to do rules. So we're going to go back to the home tab. And I'm in the inbox for the sending account, the, the my training account. And I'm going to go to the rules drop down and go to manage rules and alerts. So in here, these are the rules that we created earlier that goes to the training folder and my one that's called Trish Connor Cato goes to the manager folder. Above those, I'm going to click on the new rule button. And under stay organized, I'm going to select move messages with specific words in the subject to a folder. And then at the bottom, I'm going to click on the specific words link. And I am going to type the word tentative and I'm going to put a colon after it because that way, if somebody uses the word tentative in a subject, it won't be moved. Only the ones that have a colon afterwards, just like you see in the subject line in my inbox. And then I'm going to choose add on the right. I'm going to click OK. Now at the bottom, I'm going to, in the edit the rule description section, I'm going to click on the specified link to tell it which folder to move the email to. And so I'm on my inbox folder and over on the right, I'm going to select new. And I'm going to name this folder meeting responses and I'm going to click OK. So now it's got the meeting responses subfolder selected and I'm going to click on new again. And this one I'm going to just name tentative. And I'm going to click OK. And then OK again. So any email that comes in with tentative colon in the subject is going to be moved to the tentative folder. I'm going to click next, not going to have any conditions, not going to have any more actions, no exceptions. So I'm just clicking next until I get to the finish rule setup screen. And I'm going to check the box that says run this rule now on messages already in the inbox. And then I'm going to click finish. So now you can see if you look at my folder pane on the left, I have a meeting responses subfolder with a tentative subfolder, and that has one message in it. So now what I'm going to have you do as a challenge is to create a new rule, put it into an accepted subfolder underneath your meeting responses folder, and run it on messages already in your inbox. And when you're done, you should have both the accepted and tentative folders under your meeting responses subfolder, and each of them should have the number one flag indicating one unread message. I'm going to go ahead and click OK on the Rules and Alerts dialog box. I'm back on my calendar, and I wanted to take a moment to go over some other meeting-related settings in Outlook. So let's bring up a new meeting screen. And I just want to point out 
that on the meeting tab of the ribbon, you have under attendees, in the attendees group, I should say, you have response options. And my default set, my default setting is to let the system request responses. So when we've been doing meetings and accepting them, we're not sending a response, but a user or an attendee could easily is allowed to send responses. What's not checked on mine is allow new time proposals. So in a potential attendee, they would be able to propose a new time for a meeting if that was enabled. And if that's something that you would want to do, you could set it here at the meeting level. I'm going to just close that untitled meeting window and I'm going to go to the file tab and go down to options. And on options on the left side, go to the mail setting. And you're going to scroll almost all the way down to the bottom until you see the tracking section. So earlier in the course, I pointed out that you could always for globally request delivery and read receipts for messages in this tracking group. But there are two other settings in this group that pertain to meetings that I want to just let you know about. This automatically process meeting requests and responses to meeting requests and polls. So what it's supposed to do is it, will automatically update the meeting on your calendar. Now you saw mine is kind of like glitchy when I went into the original meeting request and it didn't say anyone had accepted, only one had tentatively accepted. The second one that has to do with meetings is update tracking information and then delete responses that don't contain comments. Well, that would update the tracking information, meaning who replied you know, to the meeting in the original meeting request, and then it would delete any responses from the inbox that don't contain comments. Now that part is actually very glitchy in 2021 outlook right now as well, because I'm still getting every response in my inbox, regardless of whether they don't contain comments. So just wanted to, maybe it'll work better on your system, but these are a little bit glitchy right now, as is the update on the actual meeting request in my calendar. I've reported them to Microsoft, these glitches that I've discovered in Outlook 2021, but maybe it's just a bad build on my system. So I'm gonna just cancel out of options. So lesson six in this module is managing contacts. And we'll be learning about that by covering how to import and export contacts, how to use electronic business cards, and how to forward contacts. Now, when it comes to using electronic business cards, you can use them for your contacts, or you can use, and or I should say, you can use an electronic business card as your email signature, and I'll show you how both ways are done. Now in this lesson, we're gonna be using that Disney.pst file from the video description. And if you have a picture of yourself on your system, we can be using that as well. So before we get into importing and exporting contacts, I want you to locate a folder on your system and it's your documents folder. And within it, you have a subfolder called Outlook Files. So when you're importing and exporting from Outlook, that's typically the folder that it's going to be looking for. And I like to organize all of my Outlook files into that folder. So I have created subfolders within that folder, but you don't have to do that. I just need you to locate that folder. On the right side of my screen, I have a Windows Explorer window, and these are the files from the video description for this course. And that's where I put that Disney.pst, it's an Outlook data file. That's where I put that file from the video description. I also have a picture of myself in that folder. I'm going to select the Disney PST file, click and hold on it, 
and I'm going to just drag it over to my Outlook Files folder, and that will move it over there. That's where it should reside. Now, when you go to export and import, you can browse to different folders. But like I said, I like to keep everything in the Outlook Files subfolder underneath my Documents folder. So now I'm in my Training Contacts folder where we created contacts earlier in the course. And now we're going to actually learn how to import contacts. So in order to do that, we have to go to the file tab on the ribbon and you'll see open and export. And then you'll see import export and you're going to click on that. So the wizard comes up and it says, choose an action to perform. And we want to import. So it's not a V card file. It's not a calendar file. It's giving you the extensions there. You can also import RSS feeds. That's not what we're looking for. So our only other choice is import from another program or file. Down in the description, it tells you such as Outlook data files, .pst and text files. So we're going to choose next there. And we're going to choose Outlook data file. And we're going to do next. And now what you're going to do is you're going to browse. And notice when you browse, it browses to that Outlook files directory underneath your documents. And so notice it even has the Disney file. It has an Outlook icon on it, and it tells you that it's an Outlook data file. We're going to double click Disney. So we have the file selected, and then you have options. So let's say we had a Disney contact in our contacts list already. We could tell it, to replace any duplicates with items imported or allow duplicates to be created or do not import duplicates. None of that applies. We don't have any of the Disney contacts in here. So I leave it on the default option just in case I would replace the duplicates with what I'm importing. And I'm going to choose next. So select the folder to import from. So it's Outlook data file is what it's going to call it. It's going to include any subfolders and you can import items into the same folder. So I want it to be in my training folder and I'm going to do finish. And so now when I'm done with the import on the left side in my folder pane, I have a Disney folder and I have those four contacts that came in from that Disney folder. Now I will say none of these contacts have a picture. I wanted to put pictures of all of the Disney characters here, but they're copywritten by Disney, so I can't use their photos in here. If you open up Donald Duck, I'll show you one thing. This address is a real address and just some random knowledge to have. That zip code is a specific zip code that's only used for Disney World in Florida. So if I click on map it, it opens in my browser window and you can see that it's Walt Disney World Resort and it's marked on the map. I'm gonna go ahead and close my browser. Now, I created a situation here that it's worth you knowing about. If you got any kind of error messages when you were trying to import the Disney file, when you look in your Outlook files directory, if it doesn't have an Outlook icon, that's a heads up to you. And it probably means that that file, when you copied it from the other folder, got marked as read only. Now this only happens occasionally, but it can be a real big stumbling block. If that happens, you would simply right click on the file and go to its properties and remove the read only attribute. 
And then you would start the import process again from your contacts folder. Just thought I would mention that because that can be a stumbling block. Now I'm back in my regular training contacts folder and I just have three contacts in here. Let's just play make believe for a little bit. Let's make believe we have 50 contacts in this folder. And these particular three contacts, they're part of our construction crew. And so typically when we email one of them, we're emailing all of them. If that's the case, you can set up a contact group. And we're going to do that by clicking the third button on the home tab of the ribbon, new contact group. And you have to give a contact group a name. So we're going to just call it construction. And then on the contact group tab of the ribbon in the members group, you're going to click on add members and select from outlook contacts. So in here, I'm going to just double click on my first of the three contacts, do the same with the second and with the third. And I'm going to click OK. So now I have a construction contact group with three members in it. And by the way, before we get out of this group, before we save and close it, I'll just point out some other things. Let's say you saved and closed it and then you realize you needed to add somebody else. You can always open the group and click add members. Conversely, you can select a member and remove a member. You can also come in here and delete the group if necessary. We're going to click the first button, which is save and close. So now in our list of contacts, we have a construction group. And when I click on it, it's showing the members. Now I only have a photo in for Charles Connor. So the other members are being shown by their initials. So let's go over to our email and bring up a new email message. And I've addressed it to the name of my contact group construction. Now notice when I do that, there's a plus sign in front of construction. If I click the plus sign, it will show me the members and it will expand the group. So you're seeing the individual email addresses. You won't be able to collapse it again. You would have to delete those individual email addresses and then type in the name of the group again. So that way we're not going to actually send this email, but that way every member that's of that group will receive the same email under their group name because they're members of the same group. So now we're ready to export our contacts. I'm going to go to the file tab from my contacts folder, my training contacts, go back to open and export. And we're going to do import export again. And this time we only have two export choices. We're going to choose export to a file. And we're going to choose next. We want to export it to an outlook data file as opposed to a CSV file. And we're going to do next. And then we get to select the folder to export from. So I'm under my training folder and I'm on just my contacts folder, not the Disney folder. And I'll actually collapse contacts. And I'm going to uncheck include subfolders because I don't want to include the Disney folder. And I'm going to do next. And so I'm going to browse again so I can give it a different name. It still has our imported file name there. So, well, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change it in that screen. I'm going to double click Disney and I'm going to type construction. So it will be a .pst outlook data file. Same options in terms of duplicates. And I'm going to simply click finish. 
Now you can add a password to this, which is optional so that anybody that you give the file to, or you would have to use the password to be able to open it. So we're not going to choose a password on this and we're going to just click OK. So go ahead and navigate to your Outlook Files folder under Documents, and you'll see that you now have a construction.pst file in that folder as well. Let's say that you just wanted to export your construction contact group. The way to do it would be to select it in your list, and then you're gonna to go to the File tab, and this has to be a Save As operation. When we exported our contacts, it exported everything, including any contact groups that you have in that folder. So where it says File Name, it gives it the name of the group. Save As Type, it defaults to Outlook Message Format Unicode. We're gonna do the drop down and choose Text Only. Now the only way to do this is via save as, saving it as text only, and then you can bring it into another application like Excel as text data. So we're gonna go ahead and choose, I'm gonna just put this on my desktop, yeah, and choose save. So now I'm gonna go to my desktop. And I see that I have that construction text file on my desktop. I'm going to use my taskbar and I'm going to launch Excel just to show you, just to play this out throughout the whole way. I'm going to just select a blank workbook. I'm going to go to the data tab on the ribbon. And in the get and transform data group, I'm going to choose from text slash CSV. And now I have to navigate to where I put that file on my desktop. There it is. I'm going to double click it. And you'll see it brings up the name of the file at the top, construction.txt. It shows the information in the file. And down at the bottom, I'm going to just click load in Excel. And so you get this queries pane on the right side. You can just close that. So this is how that data would come into Excel. You might have to clean it up a little bit, right? I might do something like copy the email addresses into another column or something like that. But that's the only way that you can get the contact group information out of your contacts list in Outlook because when you export, it exports everything in your contacts list. And I'm gonna just close Excel without saving the changes. Now we'll move on to how to use electronic business cards in Outlook. So I'm in my training contact folder and I'm gonna open the contact for Charles Connor in my case. That's the contact that I gave a picture to that I added a picture that was on my computer to. So one of the things I wanted to say is you already have seen that when you create a contact, it automatically creates an electronic business card on the upper right hand side of the screen. And that business card will contain all of the information that you've put in for your contact. You can also edit the business card and that's what we're gonna do now. On the contact tab of the ribbon in the options group, you're gonna go ahead and select business card and it opens the edit business card dialog box. So on the upper left, it shows a snapshot of the business card as is. On the right side, you have card design. On the lower left, you have a list of the fields that are on the business card and the order that they're on there. And then on the right side of that, you have an edit area. So right now the full name field is selected. And in the edit area, I could change the font, make it larger, make it bold. Well, it's already gonna be bold, italicize it, do all of those kind of things. On the right-hand side on the upper 
part of this dialog box in the card design area, I decide that I want the image to be on the right side of the card. So I'm going to do the layout drop down and choose image right. I could also choose to give the business card a background color. I choose not to. You can if you'd like. I could change the image here if I need it to. I'm going to leave it the way it is. I can change the area of the image and I'm good with the area. And I'm good with the alignment of the image in the top left. Now in the fields list underneath, I would like to add a blank line after the email address. So in the list of fields, I'm going to click on email and then I'm going to do the add button underneath the field list and I'm going to choose blank line and you can see it change instantly on the business card. Now, if I have enough space, I'm going to try it. I'm going to click in on business address and then I'm going to add and see if I can get another blank line underneath that and no. So that takes it off of the screen. So with that blank line under business address selected, I'm going to remove it. And then at the bottom, I can click OK. Now, if you make a lot of changes in here and you decide, oh, the way it was originally was fine, you can always reset the card. We're going to go ahead and click OK. And then we're going to save and close this contact. Now I can also look at my contacts in business card view. And so I'm going to just go up to the current view gallery on the ribbon and select business card view. And it's as simple as that. Now, typically when I'm creating my contacts, if I'm going to do any editing of their business cards, I do it when I create it. Now I'll circle back around and show you how to use your contact card as an email signature after we cover this next topic, which is forwarding contacts. So I can be in pretty much any of the current views to forward my contacts. And I'm going to just select one of my contacts here. And when I go on the home tab to the share group, I can go to forward contact and I get a choice. I can forward it as a business card or as an outlook contact. We'll do both. This one, the first one I have selected, I will forward as a business card. And so it's creating a dot VCF attachment. VCF is a standard format for contact files. And you see, since I selected business card, it's showing it as a business card. So I'm going to address this to my other email because this contact is in my training folder. And I'm going to go ahead and send it. So now I'm going to select the third contacts business card here in this view. And I'm going to go to forward contact. And this time I'm going to choose as an outlook contact. So this time it comes up as an outlook item and that's fine. You'll see both flavors from when I get them in my inbox for my other email. So this one I'm going to also address to my other email. And I'm going to click send. And so I'm in my inbox where I forwarded those two contacts to, and I'm on the Charles Connor email. And you'll notice it doesn't have the forward in the subject line, the FW colon, like it does in the one above it. When you forward a business card, it doesn't indicate that it's a forward. And it does an attachment, which is that VCF file format. 
And when I do the drop down next to the attachment and I choose open, it actually opens as a contact. Now, if I wanted to retain this contact in my contact list, I would save and close it. And you can go ahead and do that. And it's the same process other than it says forward in the subject line for my Richard Johnson contact, which we sent as an outlook item. And so I can do the drop down next to the attachment. I can open it. And again, it opens as a contact. It gives me a read only up here, but I can save and close it. And then it will be in Trish's contact list. You can go ahead and save and close that one as well. I switch back to my contacts folder and I'd like to show you Trisha's contacts, but I have too many confidential contacts in there to be able to put it on screen for you. But I do have Charles Connor and Richard Johnson in both lists at this point. So now I'm going to show you how to use an electronic business card as your email signature. The first thing that you're going to do is create a contact for yourself. Now I've already done this. I'm going to challenge you to do it. I will open mine as guidance for you. I added a picture that was on my system. Mine is a combination of real and bogus information. The address and phone number are, are bogus. And I edited the business card so it's not showing the address on it. And you'll notice I have a blank line after my name and another blank line after my email address. So you're going to want to make your business card look similar to mine or whatever suits your needs, but you need to create a contact for yourself. And once you're done doing that, you're going to go ahead and save and close your contact. Now we're going to set it up so that our email signature will be our electronic business card. We're going to go to the file tab and almost at the bottom on the left, you're going to go to options In outlook options on the left. You're going to click on mail and over on the right, you're going to click on the signatures button. So the first thing I'm going to do is rename my default signature from default. So it's selected and I'm going to click the rename button and I'm going to name it text. So it's a text signature. And then you notice it updates. I don't have default anymore. So it updates that it's going to use that one on new messages unless I tell it different. Now we're going to create a new signature. Now, if we hadn't created that contact card and we use this signature and we went to business card, it would only put the text that's in this box on the business card. So we're going to select new and we're going to call this one business card and we're going to click okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the text area and click in it and it should wipe out all the text that was in there. And on the right side, well, above the text box in the edit signature area, you're going to click on business card. And at the top, I've navigated to the appropriate contacts folder and I'm going to select myself in the list. I can see my business card preview at the bottom. And I am going to click OK. And now I'm going to tell it to use my business card as my default. So over on the top right, well, actually, I'm going to save first. On the top left, I'm going to save. And then on the top right where it says new messages, I'm going to do the drop down and select business card. And then I'm going to click OK and okay again. And now I'm going to switch over to my inbox. I'm going to bring up a new email and you'll notice that my business card is in there as my email signature. 
Now, let's say for this email, and it also gives it in there as an attachment, my business card. If I wanted to use my text signature right on the message tab, I can go to my signature drop down and choose text and I can switch back and forth from here. So when you have multiple signatures, you can switch between them at the message level, but you can only have one set as a default. And we're not going to send this email, just wanted to show you how it comes up. So I'm gonna close this email without saving the changes. Our seventh lesson is managing activities by using tasks. I'm not gonna show a PowerPoint slide because we only have one topic in this and it's called assign and manage tasks. So I'm gonna go to the bottom of my folders pane and I'm gonna select my task list. So just as a reminder from our earlier lesson involving tasks, your to-do list on the left side is anything that has a due date. So it could be a message that you flagged or a task that you have a due date on. And then you have your task list per email account. I'm gonna go to my task list. And on my task list, I have two tasks. And there's one that I assigned to Trish earlier in this course to my other email. And when I did that, I said, keep an updated copy on my task list. So it's on my task list. And it's also on Trish's task list. I'm gonna go back to my training task list. So I have another task on here that wasn't assigned to anybody. It's, you notice the icon here, when a task is assigned to someone, it has a little person icon on the clipboard. And when it's not, it doesn't. So this make sure printer has proposal by Tuesday task. I can look over here and see that it's overdue based on where I am now. So what I can do is if I click the check mark in front of it, it marks it as complete. So maybe I forgot to mark it as complete on the day that it was supposed to be completed, but I've marked it as complete now. And I'm gonna open it up by double clicking it. And so you can just see the details in here and the status is now completed, All right? So I can go ahead and save and close that one. Now I'm gonna go back to my Trish task list and I'm going to mark the assigning this to Trish task as complete. And when I go back to my training task list, it's also marked as complete. Now we're gonna create a task that we are going to own. We're not gonna assign it to someone else. So I'm just gonna do, I'm in my training task list and I'm gonna do control and the letter N to bring up an untitled task window. I could have clicked the new task button on the home tab of the ribbon. And the subject of this one is going to be check team availability for evaluation meetings. And I'm gonna give it a start date of the next Monday, wherever you are in your calendar. So I've already done some work on this one and the status is not started, I'm gonna change that to in progress. And I'm gonna say that I completed about 25% of the task, so I'm gonna just type that in the percent complete. And now I'm gonna save and close it. Now it's in my task list. And if I wanted to give a status update on that task to a colleague, I can. And the way to do that is to open the task by double clicking it. And then you'll notice on the task tab of the ribbon in the manage task group, there's send status report. We're gonna select that. 
and I'm going to address it to my other email, my Trish email. And you'll see what Trish will receive, the original task, right? The start date, the due date, the status, percent complete. And it was requested by training, but it's training's task. This is not assigning a task. The subject line is task status report. And I'm going to go ahead and send that. And then I'm going to save and close my task. And I just want to show you something as a process step. So go ahead and bring up another task window, another untitled task window. And when you're creating an untitled task, even before you save and close it, you have the option of sending a status report. But if you click that button right now, it's empty because you never saved the task. So I'm going to close this empty status report email and not save the changes. And I'm going to close that untitled task. So the process step is you would have to save and close the task, reopen it, and then send a status report. That's the, uh, the way it works. Just wanted to point that out. So now I'm going to give you another challenge. I'm going to have you reopen your check team availability for evaluation meetings task, update the percent complete. Don't make it a hundred percent, whatever percentage you choose above 25% and send another status report about that task. So now I'm in my Trish inbox. And I see my first task status report. This is when it was 25%. And then the one that I just challenged you to do is another status report. And I set it at 50%. So now that I've marked that task 50% complete, and I sent an updated status report, something has come up and I'm not going to be able to finish that task. So I'm going to open my check team availability task again. And this time in the manage task group on the ribbon, I'm going to choose assign task. And I'm going to address it to my other self. And I'm going to keep an updated copy of this task on my task list and get a status report when the task is marked complete. I'm also going to put a note at the bottom saying, I need to hand this off to you. If you can complete by Tuesday, that would be fantastic. Since it's kind of last minute in my case, the task is due tomorrow. So I'm just putting that in there as a note. And I'm going to go ahead and send. So you'll notice I get the one flag next to my Trish task list. And there's the task that's been assigned to me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click the task. And I'm going to accept it because it's really an invitation. So I'm going to accept it and just send a response now. It's still on Trish's task list and I'm going to double click and open it up again. And this time I'm going to just go ahead and mark it as complete. And I'm just going to do that from the ribbon. And it marks it as complete and it closes it. And now I'm back in my training task list and you see it's also marked as complete there. Now in my training inbox, because I had send me a status report when the task is completed, you'll see both of the tasks that were assigned, one that we did earlier in the course and the one that we just did are in my inbox with a status report. 
So I can click on both of those just to mark them red. So I was notified in my inbox when the tasks were marked complete. Now, some other things that you can do in your task list, you know, your mark completes, they will just stay here. Everything that's marked completed. If you want, you can use this remove from list button on the ribbon to remove a completed task or any task from the list. I can also right click on a task and have some options from that menu as well. Now, when I'm in my task list, it's going into what's known as the simple list view. Let's take a look at the detailed view. Just shows a couple of more columns. We can go to the prioritized view. And so you have different groupings, normal, right? Three items, one on red. My unread flag didn't disappear from my training task folder yet, but I don't have any unread tasks in there. And then it has none, three items that one is unread. So it's showing as both normal and having no flag. And then another list is active tasks. I have no active tasks because they're all been marked completed. And then I have completed view that I can look at. If you do the bottom arrow on the right of the current view group, the more button, you'll see that you have a today view. So tasks that are due today, the next seven days, overdue tasks, tasks that you've assigned, and then server tasks. Lesson eight is sharing workspaces with others. In this lesson, we're gonna learn how to delegate access to Outlook folders, how to share your calendar, and how to share your contacts. So to delegate access to Outlook folders, you can determine which folders you want to grant access to, as well as the permission levels that they will have. So let's go to our file tab on the ribbon. And it didn't matter whether you're in your inbox or your task list or wherever you may be. On the file tab, you're gonna click on the account settings button and I'm gonna go to delegate access. Now up here, I'm making sure I'm in my training account. And then I'm gonna click on delegate access. It lets you know that delegates can send items on your behalf, including creating and responding to meeting requests. If you wanna grant folder permissions without giving send on behalf of permissions, close this dialog box, right click the folder, click change sharing permissions, and then change the options on the permissions tab. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is on the right side, you're gonna go ahead and click add, and you're gonna select your other email address. And once you select your other email address, you'll get the delegate permissions and then the name of that person dialog box. And it says this delegate has the following permissions. By default, it gives editor permissions to calendar and task, no permissions to inbox contacts or notes. So for the calendar, it says the editor can read, create, and modify items. And you have an optional checkbox there that's checked. Delegate receives copies of meeting related requests sent to me. Now, if I click next to the drop down next to editor, you can see the different permission levels, reviewer, author, and editor, and what kinds of levels of permissions they get. And then there's also none. We're gonna leave it on editor and we'll leave that checkbox checked. I don't need my assistant, my mythical assistant here to have access to my task list. So I'm gonna do the drop down and do none. For my inbox, I'm gonna give them editor permissions and I'm gonna leave contacts and notes also as none. And then at the bottom, you have two check boxes. Automatically send a message to delegate summarizing these permissions. That's a kind of a nicety. 
and delegate can see my private items. So sometimes you might mark an item, particularly on your calendar as private. It's up to you whether your delegate can see those private items. I'm not going to check that one. I'm going to just click OK at the bottom. And then at the bottom of the delegates page, there's three option buttons. Deliver meeting requests addressed to me and responses to meeting requests where I am the organizer to my delegates only, but send a copy of meeting requests and responses to me, my delegates only, and my delegates and me. Well, if this is going to be my assistant. I'm going to just say my delegates only. And I'm going to click OK at the bottom. And I'm going to use the back arrow to get back into my inbox. So now I see the email that Trish received, letting her know that she's a delegate and what her permissions are. And it also gives further instructions to open folders for which you have permissions, click file and then open and then other users folder. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to file open and export there. And then there's other users folder. And I can just type in the name, right? And I can go, so this would be my training folk. This would be training. And then I could click OK. So because I have access to all of these email addresses, it's not going to create another training email for me here. But that's the process that you would go through. Now, there was something else when we went to assign a delegate that I want to address. I gave my delegate, and I'm going to just go back to my training email. I gave my delegate access to my inbox, and they can send on behalf of. So it said in there, if you want to change the permissions, you have to change them at the folder level. So if I right click on my training at trishtraining.com email address in my folders pane, and I go to folder permissions from there, you can see that Trish Connor Cato, this is the Trish, I put them in here and I gave them all full permissions, right? And so if I needed to change their permissions, I could change them from in here. And I could say maybe they can't delete any of my items, something like that. So it changes it up here to custom. I'm not going to change anything there. I'm going to just put it back on editor. And then I'm going to just cancel out of there. So that's kind of how that delegate process works. So if I'm Trish and I've received that email authorizing me as a delegate, when I go to my calendar, I would just go up on the ribbon to open calendar where we've been before from address book. And I would select my training email address. And because of my permission levels, you'll see on the left side, it shows up under shared calendars here. And if I no longer wanted it to show there, I could right click on it under shared calendars and I can delete the calendar. So I'm no longer seeing it. Now, in addition to assigning a delegate, you can just simply share your calendar a couple of different ways with other people. So one way I like to share my calendar, and I'll give you a scenario for this. If you don't want to make everybody a delegate, it's only if you have like an assistant or a colleague that's going to handle your work while you're out of the office or something like that. But you can share your calendar if, let's say you're trying to schedule a meeting with somebody and you've been going back and forth and you can't find an available date. What I may do at this point, and I can even do this with people outside of my organization, I might email my calendar. So first I'm going to switch back to my training calendar. And on the ribbon, on the home tab of the ribbon in the share group, 
I like to email my calendar and you can control what the recipient sees. So I'm going to click on email calendar. And the first thing that happens is send a calendar via email dialog box opens where you can specify the calendar information you want to include. So the calendar is my training calendar. I'm going to give it a date range of the next seven days. And I'm going to just select availability only the default detail section and time will only be shown as free, busy, tentative, working elsewhere or out of the office. If you look at the other choices, you have limited details. It would include the availability and the subjects of calendar items only or full details would include the availability and full details of your calendar items. I typically just show availability for this scenario. And then I'm also going to check the box underneath availability only that says show time within my working hours only. There's an advanced section that says show and nothing happens there. It's just the email layout, daily schedule or list of events. I'm going to hide that. And I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So, and we don't have to send this email. I just want to change it from which address it's coming from, but I would address it to Trish, right? But I'm not going to actually send it. You can see right in the body of the email, what the person would see. So it's training calendar, my calendar, the date range that's showing is listed there, has my time zone. And then it shows the dates on a little mini calendar that are accommodated there. It gives a legend, so the recipient will know what the icons mean. And so it's seven days. I'm actually recording this on a Sunday, so it's including that day, right? It's outside of working hours. Monday lets me know that I'm busy from 9 to 10, but I'm free my other working hours. Tuesday, so on and so forth, right? So I'm sending them the next seven days. That's what they would get if I click send. I'm going to just close that email. Another way that you can share your calendar if you haven't delegated it, you can go to share calendar in that share group on the home tab. And then you get to address it. So it composes an email address, right, from training. I'm going to address it to Trish, even though she has delegate permission. And when I'm sharing my calendar, it by default checks a box under the subject line, allow recipient to view your calendar. And you can control how much they're able to view. Availability only, limited details, or full details. I'm going to leave it on availability only this time. And then what I'm going to do is also under the subject line, there's another checkbox. I can at the same time request permission to view a recipient's calendar. I'm not going to do that with this one, but you could. And then they have the option of accepting that request when they receive your request. I'm just going to go ahead and click send on this. It confirms that I'm sharing this calendar with Trish and that the permissions are availability only. And I'm going to select yes on the confirmation. So now I'm going to switch back to the inbox. And I'm in Trisha's inbox and I see my sharing invitation for trainings calendar. So when I select that, it says training has invited you to view their calendar. Click the open button above. So I can click open. And when I click open this calendar, it takes me back to my calendar. And now my training calendar is under shared calendars. So it will remain there unless I delete it. So as a delegate, you're going to open it. 
if you are going to share it with someone that you're not making a develop a delegate, they can get it under their shared calendars as well. And once you share a calendar, either by sharing it or delegating access to it, you can click in that share group, you can click on calendar permissions. And you'll see that that training calendar is shared. This is the delegate one that's an editor. And then I have a custom one in here where they only get to read the free and busy time. I can always change some of these settings from in here if necessary. I'm going to just cancel out of there. So sharing your contacts is very similar to sharing your calendar. As a matter of fact, it's so similar that I'm going to start get you started and then I'm going to have you complete the process on your own. So on I'm in my contacts list for my training contacts list. On the home tab of the ribbon, you're going to in the share group, click on share contacts. And look how similar this is to sharing your calendar. So you get to address it. You can request permission to view their contacts folder, allow recipient to view your contacts folder is the default. So go ahead and address and send this message. And once you get that done, to get to your shared contacts in that same share group, you would open shared contacts, navigate to that folder. So I already have both of my folders here that I'm using. So if I didn't, if I just had one, then I would get my other one when I did it. So you share your contacts and then you can open those that have been shared with you from this button. Our last lesson in this advanced portion of Outlook 2021 is managing Outlook data files. We'll be learning about how to manage your Outlook data files by covering how to use archiving to manage mailbox size, how to back up Outlook items, and how to change your data file settings. Before we get into archiving in order to manage our mailbox size, let's take a look at some global archive settings. So we're going to just click on the file tab and go to options. And on the left side, we're going to click on advanced and you have your auto archive area right there. And we're going to click on auto archive settings. So we can tell it to automatically do this however many days, right? If I check the box that says run auto archive every 14 days or every seven days, you can have it prompt you before it runs. And then during auto archive, it would delete any expired emails in expired email and email folders only. It would also archive and delete archive or delete old items. So these are check boxes here. You might want it to just delete expired items when it archives or expired and archive or delete old items. Now under archive and delete old items, you can have it show the archive folder in your folder list and your default folder settings for archive would be clean out items older than whatever time period. For mine, I'm going to change it to three months. Clean out items older than three months. And then it tells it where to move old items to. And if I click in that text box and click end, right, it's going to move it to that Outlook files directory and it's going to name it archive.pst. If you want to move it to a different directory, you would do browse. Or you can tell it these are option buttons to permanently delete those old items. I'm going to keep them in a file for a while. So I'm not going to select those choice, that choice. And then I'm going to select apply these settings to all folders now. 
And then at the bottom, I'm gonna click OK. So it would auto archive for me every 14 days, I will be prompted or whatever time period you put in before it does that process. And then it would create that archive folder. It sends it to your Outlook files directory and you could also open it or import it back into Outlook if you wanna get those emails back into your Outlook. So that's one way of doing it by going to your advanced Outlook option and going and fixing your auto archive settings. We're gonna click okay to get out of there. Now I'm gonna do this on my Trish inbox cause I have older emails. At this point I'm on my Trish inbox and this time I'm gonna go to file. And if I look at mailbox settings, this is another place where I can see the size and how much free space I have, but I'm gonna click on tools and I'm gonna go to mailbox cleanup. So you can click this button to view your mailbox size again. You can tell it to find items that are older than however many days or items larger than however many kilobytes. If I click auto archive, it's gonna go by those settings. So click the auto archive button for a moment, right? And it goes by those settings that we set globally. So if I go back to my mailbox now, notice I have another group here in my folder pane called archives, and I'm gonna expand it. And if I look in my List there, I have archives, I can expand it and I can click once on inbox and you'll see everything that was archived. And also, if I look at my Outlook files folder under documents, I'll see that it created archive.pst, which could be imported in if I wanna get those files back into the appropriate inboxes. Another thing that you can do is you can simply back up Outlook items. So I'm going to click on my training email inbox. And I'm simply going to go to the file tab. And I'm going to go to open and export again. And this time I'm going to choose import export again and we're gonna choose export to a file. And next, we're gonna do an Outlook data file and next. And so I get to select the folder that I wanna export from. So I wanna export my entire training inbox, which is selected. And I'm gonna include the subfolders with that. And I'm gonna choose next. And so I'm gonna change this file name. I'm gonna double click on construction there and I'm gonna call it training inbox. And I have my options for duplicates and I'm gonna just simply click finish at the bottom. Now we're not gonna do a password here so I'm gonna just click okay. So when I go and look at my Outlook files folder, I have my training inbox.pst. So the entire inbox versus what I archived out of the other inbox. So the entire one is just a backup and that's an export operation. So why would I do that? Well, if I had a critical failure and something happened, I could import this and get all my emails back. So our last topic here is how to change or access your data file settings. So let's go to the file tab on the ribbon and I'm gonna make sure I'm in, it doesn't really matter which account I'm in here, but I'm in my training account and I'm gonna go to the account settings drop down list and click on account settings. So I'll see all of my accounts that I have. 
And then at the top, I have several tabs. I'm going to go to the data files tab. And this is showing so that new archives folder that was created when we archived our items. I have some SharePoint list in here and I have my three accounts. Now my personal account, if I click on that one and I go to settings button above the accounts. So when I do that, that is a non Microsoft exchange account, right? So when I click on that, it gives me the ability to compact that Outlook data file to reduce the size. And I'm going to just cancel out of there. I don't want to do that. If I click on my training email account and then go to settings, because these are exchange accounts, it opens up the Microsoft Exchange box. I have a general tab, can't change anything there. I have an advanced tab. I can check and uncheck some boxes, but really can't change much in here. These files are created when you add your emails into Outlook. And then I have a security tab here, which is dimmed out. Can't change anything. Now this could be because admin has set this and I just don't have access to it. But I don't think that's really an admin setting. Uh, it's just a default setting that it won't let me change. And so these are your data files. Now I'm going to just cancel and get out of this box. And with my training data file selected, notice that it's giving me a file location. That's not that location we've been using when we've been exporting or importing data into Outlook. It's in an app data folder. Now, if I wanted to see it, I could just click on this and open the file location and it takes me into that. So some of these, I have multiples in here. Don't worry about it. But some of these have an extension. You can't see it in this one. This one, you can see the dot PST. I'm going to just close that folder. When I hover over this one, you'll notice at the end of the screen tip, it's saying dot OST. So my email addresses are .ost, and that's a, a file that can be accessed whether you're online or offline. So if I turn off my Wi-Fi, I can still compose an email. I can still send it. It will hold it in my outbox. And then when I have an online connection again, it will send it for me. And then it goes to send items. So that's a offline kind of data type there. So you really, the only thing you can really do here, you can't really change many of the settings. You can set a particular email address as a default. My Trish one is my default email address. I can remove email addresses from here. So we're going to just go ahead and close that. Thank you so much for attending this Outlook 2021 video course. By way of review of what was covered in this course, we had a total of four modules that we went through. The first two modules were in the introductory portion of the course, and the last two modules were in the advanced portion of the course. In module one, we covered the basics of Outlook, and that's where you learn to navigate Outlook create and format email messages, attach items and files to emails, and track your messages. The learning outcomes for that module were that by the end of it, you'd be more efficient when managing your mailbox. You can modify settings within Outlook. You can attach files in an email, and you're able to track, recall, and resend messages. The second module was about managing Outlook. And this is where you were introduced to the tools that help you organize your messages, manage your contacts, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. By the end of that module, you were able to create folders, categories, and mark messages. You were able to add and edit contacts. You gained the ability to schedule appointments, events, and meetings and you were able to save notes 
and create tasks associated with an email. In module three, we focused on automating Outlook. So you learned more advanced settings within Outlook and you learned about the search functionality and how to automate repetitive tasks. So by the end of that module, you learned how to group, sort, filter, and search for messages. You learned how to modify settings within Outlook. You gained the ability to create automated replies, and you also learned how to create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. We also created quick steps for more automation in that module. And in our final module, Advanced Outlook Settings, we did a deeper dive into the tools that help organize your messages, manage your contacts, assign tasks, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. You also learned how to share and delegate your mailbox and other Outlook folders to coworkers. So you learned how to work with multiple calendars, creating them, right? You also learned how to import and export contacts. You learned how to delegate access to folders and how to share items, Outlook items with other users. You were able to create and assign tasks and you learned some more task stuff that we didn't cover previously. And we ended by you learning how to back up your Outlook items, as well as how to change your auto archive settings and auto archive items. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.